A very good afternoon to all of you present here today in this ICPR sponsored three day long national webinar on comparative aesthetics, philosophical perspectives from the East and West organized by the Department of Sanskrit, Coach Bihar Panchanan Burma University, West Bengal. Today is the third and last day of this webinar. Today we have two important lectures in this third and last academic session one by Professor Arun Ranjan Mishra sir and the other one is by Professor Shivli, Shivli Basu madam. Uh, we have also uh, a valedictory address by Professor Raghunath Ghosh sir, Emeritus Professor of North Bengal University. So we will start our third academic sessions right now. Let me first introduce our first speaker of this session, Professor Arun Ranjan Mishra sir. Professor Misro studied his master's in Sanskrit from Utkal University, Orisha. He received his MPhil and PhD from Pune University. He also received a senior fellowship from Gandhi Center of Science and Human Values, Bangalore in 1989. He served the Orisha Education Service through OPSC, uh, Public Service Commission, I think from 1992-2008 as a lecturer, then as a reader, and finally as an associate professor before joining the Vishwabharati University, a central university at Shantiniketan, Birbhum, West Bengal, as an associate professor in 2008. He then became a professor in the same department, that is Department of Sanskrit, Pali and Prakit at Vishwabharati in 2011. He also served the department as the head several times. Almost 32 books in his name. He is one of the great creative writers in modern Sanskrit writing and modern Odisha, Odia writing in the country. He is equally adept, adept uh, at creative and critical writing in both the languages that is that are Sanskrit and Odia. The sheer volume of his creative writings uh, makes him an outstanding personality in the field of uh, of the of sanskrit <clears throat> and odia literature some books are worth mentionable like like shunya meghaganam collection of sanskrit poems published in 2021 corona kampa post modern Sanskrit Kavya, published in 2022. Tabo Manumaya Rekhasu, collection of Sanskrit poems, published in 2018. Netra Prante Nispanda Samayaha, collection of Sanskrit poems, published in 2019. Then uh, Charipad Bhui, collection of Odia poems, published in 1994. Parastha Vasant, uh, collection of Odia poems, uh, published in 1997 uh, and some of the uh, some of other books like uh, research books like bibliography of Naya Vaisheshika published in 1993 pre-existence of effect published in 1996 contemporary Sanskrit writings in Odisha and Naya concept of cause and effect relationships relationship in published in 2008 and the very uh, new two books are Acharya Radhavallava Tripathinaha Kabya Kala Parishilanam from Shivalik Publication, Delhi, published in 2022 this year, and Obhiraja Rajendra Mishrasya Navya Natya Sangrachana Kaushalam from the same publication, that is Shivalik Publication, Delhi, published in this year. Uh, his specialization mainly are classical and modern Sanskrit literature, as you have already known. Uh, aesthetics, Indian aesthetics and Western aesthetics, Indian philosophy and Veda. More than 100 research pub papers have been published by him so far. He attended almost uh, 220 seminars or conference either as an invited speaker or as a resource person or as a chair or as a keynote speaker. Uh, he has been uh, he has been the recipient of many national awards for his literary output. Uh, some of these are worth mentioning, like 
Sahitya Patra Puraskar from Brahmapur University, Orisha in 1999. Best Paper Award twice. He received twice uh, the Best Paper Award from the All India Oriental Conference in Varanasi in 2004 and again in Jammu in 2006. Then Bikrama Kalidasa Puraskar from Ujjain in 2009. Vyasa Bharati Samman from Raurkela, Orisha. And Arsha Vidya Bharati by Arsha Vidya Kendra Bhuvaneshwar to the, in this year. Samskrita Bhushana by Loka Bhasha Prachar Samiti Puri this year. So uh, that is uh, all of you. That is uh, Professor Arun Nanjan is uh, for all of you. Is a brief introduction. So I request Professor Runanjan Mishra to deliver his lecture. And the title of his lecture today is Aspects of Beauty in the East and West in, in the East and West. So thank you, Professor Arunanjan Mishra, sir. Please, sir, start. Om Sudha Samudranta Hridhanamani Dvipa Sangrida Vilvata Vi Madhya Kalpa Dhruma Kalpa Kadamba Kantara Vasapri Kriti Vasapri Sarva Loka Pri Devi Tubham Namo Devi Tubham Namo Devi Tubham Namo Thank you Dr. Sen for your kind words for me. Esteemed organizers of Panchanan Burma University, Coach Bihar, and my co speaker, Professor Shivli Vasu, our learned gathering here online, and friends. Uh, well, I can say that uh, some 11 years back I had written a book like this. I can say reflections on. Reflections on aesthetics <laughs> and uh, poetics. Very sorry, sir. Very sorry, sir. Please mute, please mute, please please mute, please mute, please mute, please mute, please mute, please mute, please 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 please mute, uh, but surely I will move on beyond this book. I will speak uh, something more. But uh, primarily, or uh, first of all, I wish to uh, take references from my own book. Well, when I say the concept of beauty or aspects of beauty in the West and uh, the East, uh, we have to go to the very necessity of beauty in art form in poetry, etc. A very interesting uh, uh, note I got from G. Murray in his uh, Principia Ethica. He says that uh, nature is too vast. Nature has beauty, no doubt. It is too vast. We cannot apprehend the whole of its uh, beauty or even a part of, of its uh, beauty is also not really comprehensible by human eyes. And secondly, nature, nature has two sides, its beautiful side and its horrific side also. Now, art uh, eternalizes the beauty of nature. And that is why beauty is indispensable in art. No doubt, we never object to it. But nature, when it is a combination of both beautiful and ugly, art uh, chops off the ugly part and presents the beautiful part. That is what Mure says in his uh, uh, book, Principia Ethica. Uh, on the second point, uh, we modernist or postmodernist do not agree. We feel that the ugly elements have also a good part in uh, art, in literature, in poetry. We will come to that afterwards. Because it is uh, as well from uh, right from the inception of uh, the concept of Rasa, we have Vibhatsa, etc. Professor Radhavalov Tripathi was also saying about it. 
so uh, not only shringara but vibhatsa is also a part of uh, art and then uh, if beauty is there what is, what was the situation in the ancient and medieval period uh, especially in sanskrit lit uh, literature and all the literature that followed sanskrit literature they were over enthusiastic to collect the parts of beauty and uh, plant them in their literature this over enthusiasm created a lot of trouble because of which many rhetoricians have to admonish that you control yourself don't use alankaras in a place where it is not really necessary some such things we know anandavardhan is famous for that for admonishing admonishing many times and all that i will just come to there are many many examples i will just come to only one example which uh, professor radhavallabh tripathi also referred to that is in mahabharat stri parva um, uh, verse uh, uh, 24 by 19 i am sa rasanot karsi pinastana nivardana nabhiru jaghana sparsi nibi bisransana kara so the wife of bhurisraba is on the war field mahabharat war and uh, she finds the body of uh, her husband bhurisrava and describes him when a woman is wailing for her husband who is lying on the field and uh, at that time ayam sa rasanot karsi pino stana nimardana nabhi uru jaghana sparsi nibi bisransana kara such a kind of uh, description of his hand of bhurisrava dead bhurisrava is not really appropriate but still we did it why because we had a kind of a habit i will not say practice rather habit of plucking beautiful pieces from different uh, uh, places of nature parts of nature and uh, uh, plant them in our uh, writing that is what is has been done here even by byasa who is mahakavi in sahitya darpan chapter 3 it is say it is said that uh, eroticism and pathos they are opposed to each other shringara and uh, uh, karuna they are opposed to each other therefore uh, such kind of description when there is a uh, kind of atmosphere of uh, karuna pathos should not be there but still it is being defended by sahitya darpan because of this practice or this habit of collecting beauty and putting it in literature in uh, chapter 7th of uh, chapter 7 of sahitya darpan he says no this is uh, just a kind of memory here the wife of bhurisrava remembers what this hand of uh, his her husband was doing so it's a kind of memory not the actual uh, shringara here the memory of shringara so we can excuse uh, we do not know how this memory also cannot affect cannot blur the art itself the atmosphere of karuna itself that we do not know but uh, uh, the same sahitya darpan gar and others have also criticized bhatnarayana for having described the union between durjodhana and his wife parasulochana uh, just before the war durjodhana is going to war in act 2 of bani sanghara and he relaxes with his wife that is described and that is criticized but here it is not uh, criticized uh, that we have to take uh, uh, account of even the mahakavi like uh, kavi guru you can say like kalidasa he is also trapped trapped by this tendency and tendency is plucking beautiful and uh, collecting it and uh, planting it in the death of uh, hindumati when aza is crying wailing after her there also see the wordings madirakhi madananarpitam madhu pitwa rasavat kathan nume anupasya si baspa dusitam etc so she is dead again madirakhi that kind of address mad mad anana arpita madhu pitwa etc etc are also there now why all the all these things happened once and again we presume that uh, because they were court poets 
king desires that shrungara should be given primacy and therefore shrungara we find everywhere even inside the context of karuna that we get astonishingly the same thing is also being said in ars poetica by horace i have a article uh, concept of poet in the east and west uh, 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 where all other side of this context has been discussed i will not go into that but horace who has been discussed by me in 2013 published in uh, gonganath uh, jha research institute allahabad there uh, i have mentioned this thing that in ars poetica horace says why all this happens he says that a crazy poets poet who happens to be the victim of each His word is kabij, for it says, each of the king's digits, morbus regius, king's digits, of some frantic hallucinations, fanaticus error, or of lunacy, iracunda diana, or perhaps the perhaps of a man who has defiled the ancestral ashes, words of so strong word of Horace, defiled the ancestral ashes or disturb the consecrated spot by writing all these things means a shringara in place of karuna or some such things inappropriate therefore this has never in the aesthetic exercise in india this is not the lone case in west also it all happens and uh, uh, in ars poetica horace laments on it moreover we also come to the beauty that has been conventionally more connected with eroticism that we all know but perhaps this is this has led to a degeneration in sanskrit poetry i am speaking of sanskrit poetry in the middle age even in ancient days we saw it in vyasa's writing apart from a small deal with heroic sentiment the sanskrit poetry concentrated on eroticism so main part of their aesthetic exercise is focused on eroticism and they felt that that is the beauty even the pathos of bhavabhuti had no takers karuna ras the propounder of uh, the uh, primacy of karuna theory bhavabhuti was not accepted by anybody on the other hand pathos was connected with the uh, forms of best poetry in the west edgar allan poe he says that pathos is really connected with uh, um, this beauty pathos has more closeness with beauty poe says uh, he is american poet short story writer we all know a literary theorist great literary, literary theorist we can say he speaks of the thirst for beauty in selis phrase the desire of famous phrase we all know it the desire of the moth for the star Ibsen is the man who said that the best that is the best poetry that conveys our saddest thoughts he connects uh, poetry with uh, best poetry with sadness and therefore poe also says that uh, we find uh, uh, melancholy karunata inside uh, uh, the beauty also and uh, in his uh, philosophy of composition his book's name is the philosophy of composition he declares beauty of whatever kind in its supreme development invariably excites the sensitive soul to tears to tears melancholy is thus the most legitimate of all the poetic tones and uh, we should not be astonished because uh, in many places also beauty generates pathos beauty generates a kind of melancholy let us go to the first uh, canto of uh, naishadhiya charitam now nice um, uh, sriyasa uh, the hero uh, nala uh, is in uh, separation missing the heroine he saw in the dream damanti and he goes to the forest whatever beautiful part he sees in the forest you see the nature is coming we were very conscious about the nature and its beauty and its collectability and in nature he says whatever beautiful flower flower he sees he becomes sad he becomes depressed connection of beauty with melancholy and depression and sadness that kind of thing also we experience in many other places i just gave one example 
from Naishadha. And uh, other uh, uh, Eastern and Western poets have also subscribed to this view that uh, uh, melancholy is a core inside the beauty too. Uh, we won't uh, go to too much uh, uh, description on those points because I have uh, many other things uh, thought out to say. But again, the most uh, obvious, the ostensible thing we see in this tendency of bringing beauty from nature to uh, poetry is overuse of ornaments. When there was only four ornaments in the Veda, four ornaments uttered by Bharata in Nati Shastra towards the time of Afya Dikhita, 128 principal ornaments we find. Leave aside the other uh, subtitles, sub branches. And in this way, we see that the over usage of ornaments is a, also a, on a tip of the iceberg of our tendency to bring beauty and present it forcefully in literature. Ananda Vardhana has many times said, Madam, uh, also Professor Vijay Goswami also said about the, this Rasa Khittatayatasya Bandha Sakyatiyo Bhavet Aprutag Jatna Nirvartya. So, without extra effort, we should not use alankaras in order to beautify our poetry. That is the advice of uh, uh, Ananda Vardhana. That she was saying, that is very much uh, true. And uh, this uh, tendency, we have to leave out. In many places, even uh, uh, Kabhimimans also, how to, how, what are the things we have to leave out and what are they are to be accepted. Even uh, uh, Ananda Vardhan also says, Kale Grahana Tyagucha. In proper context, we have to accept something. In proper context, we have to leave out something. These things actually make a thing beautiful. And this is actually art. Professor Tripathi was also saying, giving the example of uh, 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 stone idol, that all unnecessary stone parts are to be just uh, chiseled out so that the real beautiful murti, the idol can come out. Therefore, unnecessary persons are to be uh, just uh, kept out. This is what in the context of Saundarija has been said by Mamana. Saundarija Malankara, Kabyam Graham Malankara, the first uh, aphorism. Second is Saundarija Malankara. Third is Saha. Gunalankara Hanadana, Guna Dosalang, Dosa Gunalankara Hanadana Bham. So Dosas Hana, we have to just check so that poetic blemishes do not creep in to our art. And Guna and Alankara, we have to uh, bring them into our art. That kind of thing has been said. The same is being said, Kale, Grahana, Tiago, etc. The same thing we also get. In the story of Michelangelo, we know the famous uh, Italian sculptor. He says, Beauty is the purgation of uh, superfluity. Michelangelo, very, very famous for his uh, sculptures. And he says, There lies the beauty where we purge out the superfluity. Super, uh, Raymond, also in his poetry as a representative art, has uh, said very nice thing, the one truth underlying all the rules laid down for the employment of figure, about figure of speech, alankara, etc., is that nothing is gained by any use of those which do not add to the effect of the thought to which they give expression. So therefore, overuse of, over usage of uh, uh, poetic ornaments are also criticized by Raymond. And uh, that is also once and again criticized by Ananda Vardhana and all other people, right from the age of Bhama. So here also uh, we strike a similarity here. Walter Pater, he is also a famous uh, Western thinker. And uh, he says uh, very, uh, very strongly, but very pleasantly. He says the ornaments are diversions. You see his words. Ornaments, ornaments are diversions, a narcotic spell 
on the pedestrian intelligence. We cannot attend to that figure, that flower there, just then surpluses. For in truth, all art consists in the removal of surpluses. So this is what uh, the exercise of uh, aesthetic uh, uh, vyapara is. And we have to be very cautious while taking something into our art. Same thing has been also said by Ananda Vardhana, Rasabhavadi Tatparyam Asritya Vinivesanam. Tatparyam Asritya Rasabhavadi Vinivesanam. So without knowing the implications, the contextual meaning, we should not use uh, all those uh, alankar, etc. Therefore, alankritinam sarvasam alankaratto sadhanam. Only the alankrit will be justified when they really make alankarana. Without that, their alankaranatva will be destroyed. Vishwanath also is famous for saying, rasadin upakurbanto alankaraste angadadivat. Shemendra also says, Kabyasyalam Alankarehi. He is very, very much a uh, uh, vehement opposer of Alankaras. If they are intentionally, forcefully, with effort, they are used. So he says, Alankaraha, Alankarehi Kabyasya Alam. Even without Alankara, a good Kabya can be produced. That is his opinion. In this way, we can uh, find that. Uh, uh, Beautification is a kind of thing which has to, which is surrounded by many, many problems and we have to be very cautious and uh, uh, we have to make a newness in uh, our creation, not the repetition of old things, Pragyan, Avanava, Unmesh, Salini, Pratibha, etc. that we all know. Newness is the heart of uh, beauty. Even though beautiful, if you once and again write like uh, Kalidasa, they are not going to give pleasure to the people who are conscious of uh, the things already uh, have been written, that have been written. And uh, that is why uh, Lochana says that Pratibha Aparva Vastu Nirmana Kshama Pragya. Therefore, Aparva Vastu has to be done. Even from the Vedic age also, Aparva was necessary, Nutanatva was necessary even in the oldest sutta agni sutta it is being said that uh, uh, old poets and new poets agni hi purbe bhi rusi bhi riddya nutane ruta all those things are also said there and kabyam janaye nabiya rigved says so we are uh, uh, nabyas nabya poets we are creating new poetry that kind of expression is also found so newness is a crux of uh, uh, beauty that we know. Chane chane jat navata mupeti tadeva rupam ramaniya taya. So Sisupala Vathamagha says that every moment if newness doesn't come, a transmigration of meaning doesn't come, then uh, beauty doesn't stand before us. We see something old patterns, just old uh, models we see. Therefore, they do not uh, really please us. And uh, what we find in people, they try to take some ideals, they try to idealize them, idealize them in their work. But if they, if they are really repeating things, then that kind of idealization fails. And hence, we are not pleased with those uh, uh, models. We are not really pleased, pleased uh, with uh, those models. And Croce, Croce has said that poetic idealization is not a frivolous embellishment. You are going to take some ideal and idealize your poetry or uh, art, but it is not just a frivolous embellishment, but a profound penetration in virtue of which we pass from troublous emotion to the serenity of contemplation. I will come to contemplation and bliss, etc. if time permits, but then this is the thing where uh, uh, we are here, that uh, beauty, when consciously being created, creates trouble for the creator and also for the uh, conosers, you can say. 
Now, uh, we all know that uh, Plato was opposing poets. He has, in his ideal state, in the book Republic, he has banished poets because they were the panderers of emotions. So while doing with emotions or rasas also, we have to be very cautious. And in many places, our ancient predecessors were not cautious that uh, our uh, um, critics have already said, uh, showed many times. And uh, I'm not going into that. But then poetry, its connect, uh, connection with the spiritual life is very ancient, right from the Rigveda. Rigveda is the first text that shows us that prayer is the only means or the ancient most means to have a communion with God. And it all came uh, to other parts of uh, the world later on because uh, Veda is the oldest uh, text. 18th century German uh, aesthetes, they also took up and connected poetry as a new means uh, of spiritual regeneration. Schlegel, Frederick Schlegel saw poetry and especially metaphor as a perennial mother speech, a poet, a promise and a vehicle of future human perfection. To him, poetry is most creative and highest philosophy. Poetry or art for that matter is the supreme fact. Poetry wrote Novalis. Novalis is another German aesthetician. He says, is a genuine, absolute reality. You see, they are taking to that height. The more poetical, the more true. The more poetical, the more true. We'll come to that beauty and truth if time permits. And uh, there are many, many aspects here which uh, we are not uh, going into because uh, the talk will be too long, too, too long. I have many, many things to say. Uh, therefore, I will leave out something which I decided to speak, in fact. But uh, one thing is true, that uh, truth and beauty, when this uh, came, they connected it uh, with uh, uh, spiritualism and all those things. And uh, in some parties also there, uh, it was being uh, described by Dr. Anirban also. And uh, Kruce, Hegel, all those people, uh, Kant, they gave much space to intuition. And therefore, uh, that part is there. But then beauty, if beauty is a woman, uneducated woman, beautiful woman, uneducated. If art is a beautiful woman, uneducated, then it doesn't uh, really uh, mesmerize the conusers. Therefore, some sort of intellectual elements has to be there. Though it is produced through intuition, it has to have a kind of intellectual element. I will say something on uh, uh, truth and beauty. Uh, to, to our merriment, Keats uh, regards beauty and truth as identical. In his poem, Odd on a Grecian Orn, it's a very famous poem we all have read in our school life. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all he know on earth and all he need to know. He says to, in a letter to uh, Bailey, 1817, 22, 22nd November, 1817. This is the date of the letter. He says to Bailey, I am certain of nothing but the holiness of hearts, affections, of the truth of imagination. So imagination is true. What imagination sees as beauty must be truth, whether it exists before or not. So in this way, he identifies beauty and truth, which has not been accepted by many, many. And this uh, non-acceptance has been led by A.C. Bradley, who in his uh, book on the letters to kids, all the letters of kids he has analyzed and I, he has given his comments. And he says, I should observe perhaps that uh, kids' position as formulated above is accepted, uh, is accepted, means if uh, accepted, if kids' position is accepted. The question still remains whether a truth 
which is also beauty or a beauty which is also truth can be found by man man cannot discover them discover them as if so and if so whether it can in strictness be called by either of these names neither they will be uh, uh, beauty nor truth because man cannot apprehend them cannot comprehend them perhaps we can also accept parallel rather to uh, come to a lower rung we can accept it that there is a parallelism parallelism between uh, truth and beauty not identity that we can accept and uh, beauty is given in intuition and truth may be approached through conceptual thinking they have uh, uh, two lines one is conceptual thinking and another is intuition but still we can say that they go parallel but they will not touch each other, each other. and uh, while considering truth and beauty of western scholars we have many many uh, thinkers in indian counterparts who also felt about the same problem but they have accepted that there should be some truth in whatever we are doing <coughs> yes drama on the stage whatever is going on is not absolute a kind of absolute truth that everybody accepts but even then elements of truth cannot be completely wiped out so art has to be imbibed with truth too chemendra in his aujitya vichara charcha he says very very uh, beautiful thing in this context kavyam hrudaya sambadi satya pratyaya nischayat tattu chita vidhanena jatyupa deyatan kave so kavya is hrudaya sambadi there will be real dialogue between uh, the reader and the writer only when there is satya pratyaya there is a feeling of uh, truth inside it whatever is written without that uh, it is difficult so he says it as a tattu chitya the uh, uh, 27th kind perhaps of aucitya uh, uh, and uh, similarly another place he also says uchitena vicharena charutam yanti suktaya so suktaya poetry becomes beautiful uchitena vicharena charutam yanti suktaya this is not uh, some wise saying not subhasita rather a rhetorician writes in his treatise uchitena vicharena charutam yati janti suktaya therefore intellectualism and also uh, the truthfulness would be there in uh, art that is the opinion of uh, khemendra uh, we can say but uh, art is not uh, really no more beautiful in traditional sense that also we have to accept in both east and west in modern times art is different it's not uh, the ancient and medieval um, art where beauty was the crux of thing or the centrality of the thing plato del 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 to it beautiful beautiful to calon he says in greek in the three three of his dialogues phaedo symposium and phaedrus in the phaedo the beautiful things are beautiful by reason of beauty that is by participating in the beautiful in the symposium and phaedrus the preparation or approach is that of a lover by way of a mortal beauty the lover graduates in the symposium from single beautiful bodies to all beautiful bodies from bodies to forms and from forms to practices and notions until he contemplates the vast sea of beauty and all those things he says therefore he in this way he deals with the uh, beautiful in a different uh, kind of uh, structure where exercise aesthetic exercise is uh, completely although he is a, uh, an old man we can say grand old man of aesthetics he gives very very modern opinion and that is what practically we see in modern writers and modern uh, artists aristotle he has seen poetry as a serious art 
not you just uh, go on writing anything but serious art that reaches its perfection only when a poet is not totally affected by the desire to please the readers you should not uh, just uh, a poet should not uh, an artist should not uh, just uh, uh, be after pleasing the readers that is what uh, uh, plato says he should not do it and whether poetry is something which charms as homer or uh, thracians or something which teaches as hesiod or uh, boeotians they all were doing like this only on didactic aspect of poetry poetry mane it is an uh, kind of uh, in a inherited issue you can say which aristotle met not head on but by the oblique device of saying that poetry is something which pleases us by being an image and by being at the same time very serious and very philosophic so his uh, phrase is a philosophic term kai spouted term and uh, plotinus another he is a very famous uh, thinker uh, plotinus describes beauty as a beautiful reality making it far higher than the product of an indulgent poet therefore connection of reality with beauty has been very very clearly being done here and po we have discussed uh, po he has also uh, given his time to this aspect of uh, thinking uh, however uh, both sides east and west as far as uh, the poetry is concerned but art in general even uh, an artist uh, uh, um, uh, draws a picture that has also a meaning and his uh, uh, picture is word so word meaning concept is there everywhere and in that sense both the sides east and west they give thrust on a meaning whatever is there it should be it should have a meaning if uh, somebody is not uh, conosan enough he may not be able to get the meaning but uh, beauty has to be a meaning all the beauty has all charms beauty is inexpressible that we all know even then it should have some meaning beauty is inexpressible it is a hovering flitting and glittering shadow whose outlines elude the grasp of definition this is being said by the famous german poet goethe but still then one has to uh, have a quest for the meaning and uh, he has to be satisfied and uh, pleased through the meaning only the tradition of seeing beauty in the meaning reached in the genic especially in uh, sanskrit literature at the time of bharavi who gave uh, much uh, thrust to the uh, artha part of it so bharavi er artha garvam is a famous uh, dictum and uh, why this artha part because without artha our ma- mind cannot grasp the things mind will convert convert that artha into the word and understand it but therefore the primacy of artha is there but uh, both are to be there therefore yo artha sahrudaya slagya kavyatmeti vyavasthita it has been said in uh, dhanyaloka ramani artha pratipadaka shabda artha is there and it has the primacy and vagartha yo sampruto you all know why 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 artha has a primacy and uh, uh, word has to accompany it because in our tradition we say artha is shiva and meaning is shiva and word is parvati shakti artha sambhu shiva vani tantra loka abhinav gupta so this in the kashmirian shaiva tradition they feel that uh, artha is represented by shiva and shabda is represented vani is represented by parvati and because of that only kailasa used it in the beginning of uh, raghuvansha because he subscribed to kashmirian shaivism he spent uh, much time in kashmir for his learning for his studying therefore he has many reflections of uh, kashmiri shaivism in his uh, uh, aesthetic exercise and uh, the shiva and shiva they are behind this for which artha uh, 
has to be there and you cannot just have a jugglery of words without a significant meaning you may have some uh, artha but uh, that has no importance at all what you wanted to say if it is a jugglery of words you want to impress upon the readers through your uh, choice of uh, alliterations repetitions then uh, this is not the ideal poet and that is what is not envisaged through art that we can say and uh, while going into another aspect of uh, uh, this uh, process we can say that uh, we have uh, in eastern side on the charuta ramyata we have a very strict notion and we go by that a very interesting thing has been said shastra mane na jo ramya sa ramyo nanya eva bhi kalas says jo according to the shastras to our uh, poetics if artha is not coming if beauty is not unfolding then that is not real beauty shastra mane na jo ramya so ramyo nanya eva hi abhinav gupta is more vibrant saying that natyeva rasah na loke ityartha so he says that uh, uh, don't think that uh, everything all uh, meaning etc whatever we are seeing as beauty it is just imaginary on, on the stage not like that natye that is rasa but its reality is, is inside the loka but yes that rasa which you are getting which uh, you are uh, rather uh, tasting having a charvana is not found in common place in the loka that is definitely sure and uh, i would uh, definitely go to william blake who he is the famous uh, poet painter engraver and visionary thinker you all know uh, friends art was he says art was more than a matter of beautiful effects we are not satisfied with the beauty only art is more than that that he claims it embodied a vision of reality and it was the vision that was supremely important such being the case the indulgent pursuit of the element of beauty is surely not in favor of art he has a book what is art 1898 it was published in 1898 what is art uh, sorry not black but leo tolstoy i have come to already come to leo tolstoy he says leo tolstoy says in what is art he describes art as the highest life conception of a time art is nothing but highest life conception we are thinking that uh, literature is the mirror of society gone are the days we are again going back to people uh, like uh, leo tolstoy who say that highest level of life comprehension at least we can come the criticism of life now art is criticism of life and he he has also another phrase the highest level of life comprehension that is closer to the criticism of life while defining the uh, art or poetry we can use these two phrases phrases of uh, leo tolstoy and uh, uh, in our system also uh, we all know that kavyam cha kavi karma cha something like that is there i had used it somewhere here uh, that uh, shastram cha kavi karma cha so shastra and kavi karma there are two aspects of poetry and uh, uh, when we say shastra our criticism the uh, side of criticism already comes in and uh, i will come i don't know whether i will get time but uh, i will come to one phrase or one word closer to intuition and that is recollection so without recollection we are not going to create anything so whatever previous impressions are there they are recollect recollected in tranquility as uh, wordsworth has already said that we'll say now but uh, in the book uh, phaedrus plato sees beauty to be of two types heavenly and worldly two types of beauties beauties 
whenever there is apprehension of beauty in art or in nature the connoisseur achieves a recollection of the true beauty in the heaven a recollection of the true beauty of heaven that manifests as art that is what he says and uh, uh, we can also uh, go to kalidasa for that plato says the poet merely gets a fragrance of the heavenly beauty he cannot create beauty he is a creator of meaning that is there but uh, he reflects the heavenly beauty and uh, we all are famous with the famous verse of abhyan sakuntalam ramyane bikshya madhuranscha nisabda nisamya sabdan etc so there a kind of recollection is being uh, interpreted in that verse and uh, through that recollection recollection only an artist create something a poet write something and avigyana word in the title itself of avigyana sakuntalam avigyana is nothing but uh, recollection and that uh, idea is also from the philosophy uh, kashmiri savijim ishwara pratyavigya philosophy so uh, while uh, uh, meeting with the supreme god all on a sudden suppose one can recognize oh yes this is the supreme being described in shastra or saw, uh, seen by me in the meditation that kind of thing is pratyavigya and uh, uh, what's worth text this kind of recoll uh, recollection in his uh, uh, prefaces to lyrical ballads he says uh, these things we all know uh, spontaneous overflow of mind from the recollection of feelings uh, collected in tranquility all uh, all those things so uh, what wordsworth says has already been said by kalidasa here and not only that bhavaguti has said it very very elaborately in uh, uh, ramcharit manas uh, uttar ramcharit it is been described described how balmiki writes the first verse and uh, it is all on a sudden he uses a phrase much less people have uh, concentrated on that phrase and that is uh, akasmika pratyabhavas bhavuti uses it akasmika pratyabhavas i will say that this is the root of spontaneous overflow of mind of wordsworth what wordsworth said its root was there in uttar ramcharita in the form akasmika pratyabhavas so i will not detail into that perhaps uh, this word is uh, well understood by uh, the students of sanskrit is uh, sanskrit so i will not go into that uh, rather i will come to another aspect that is anukarana we all know that in the chapter 1 of natya shastra we have uh, uh, many many places where bharata says that uh, uh, poetry or art is nothing but a kind of mimesis a kind of imitation and that is what uh, uh, in greece it has been said socrates says the same thing and other uh, people also say and uh, other western thinkers even before socrates sophist georgias of 470 ad he also says the same, same thing and uh, anukarana part is always there and in the beginning when we referred to mure we had already said that uh, this kind of mimesis from nature uh, poet does on an artist does and uh, for that only he has been criticized by uh, plato in republic who says that uh, poets are uh, what poets are doing they are twice removed twice removed from reality their poetry is twice removed from reality why because nature imitates god and these poets imitate uh, imitate nature so they are twice removed from reality that kind of thing he criticizes and says uh, that has been solved and even aristotle completely rejected what plato said against the poets and he has supported uh, all those things are there as far as aesthetic exercise is concerned we can say that whatever an artist creates whether it is true or false truth and beauty we all we described very uh, recently some minutes back but then there are some thinkers who says uh, who say that uh, 
it is a kind of a pleasant deception you can say pleasant deception the give and take of uh, this deception is for the purpose of uh, distributing pleasure or hedonism you can say and uh, uh, this uh, uh, give and take between the readers and the writers or the audience and the uh, abhinetas all those things actors so there is a kind of give and take but the total atmosphere is a kind of deception but uh, our answer to that our thinkers also say that that who is going to say that uh, we are going to discuss truth on the stage or give sermon on god or truth on stage through our characters we are creating a kind of atmosphere which is alaukika the word alaukika is there in our tradition which means it is far removed from the vastava the real world and therefore uh, that is not a not really a problem for indians and uh, lock he is a famous uh, a british thinker british atheist and political thinker also i have read his political philosophy very very uh, closely british atheist thinker john lock he says that beauty whether in art and stage or in nature has no foundation in our mind it is a product of mere customs and manners one thing is beautiful to us but in another culture that may be ugly to them those people therefore beauty can be uh, rather apprehended is being apprehended rather through customs and manners he is he said a different thing altogether and fancy or imagination of artist says lock john lock gives false colors appearances resemblances to what it uh, presents and diverts the unwary spectators from truth and all those things are there but uh, uh, as i have already said that uh, indian uh, counterparts have already uh, answered to this uh, objection because uh, uh, we have already said that we are doing with alaukik part of thing therefore uh, your uh, uh, assertion that it is all a pleasant uh, uh, deception is not really very much effective on our thoughts uh, on our aesthetic thoughts because uh, sthai bhav is there in our uh, laukik sphere and uh, raso is there in our alaukik sphere we have made a total sphere for raso we have designed that in our model and therefore uh, we can say that uh, that we have done but what we have exactly done we we have done it through a kind of exercise what is that aesthetic vapor and that vapor is nothing but uh, thing seeing things in nature polishing it describing and re describing it i'll give uh, the definition of a poet presented proposed in rigveda you see this is the oldest definition of poet suparnam vipra kavayor vacho bhi ekam santam bahudha kalpayanti rigveda 10 114 5 so ek what is there perched on the branch of a tree and the poet he can describe him in many many ways and that is art that is poetry and what he does he simply cleanses up some idea and presents it present the image of bird in one way then cleanses up another idea presents the image of bird in another way so that kind of thing so cleansing thing a poet uh, does therefore this uh, uh, idea is very much there in many many places in rigveda uh, professor uh, arvi tripathi was also hinting upon it so twasta rupai rapinsat rigveda 10109 twasta beautified earth and sky with colors you see so apinsat sayana says apinsat means rupa vatyu akarot subha sobhistha this is a phrase rigveda 7565 maruts you see marut and uh, marut and soma they are the principal deities of aesthetics indian aesthetics or you can say world aesthetics maruts they when they come out they are 49 brothers when they come out they decorate themselves they wear collarium in their eyes 
they give foundation to their faces they wear very beautiful dresses and that kind of description description started and uh, indian aestheticism started there from and uh, with them joined usa there are 25 suktas of on usa and usa and her beauty also generated aestheticism in uh, vedic culture and that is our root of indian aesthetics and then another is soma soma represented uh, usa and uh, um, these uh, um, maruts they represented the abhinaya part and soma represented the kavya part they represented natya part soma represented kavya part the gurgling sound of soma falling down from one pot to another and that is being described once and again and uh, some uh, images of poetry are being drawn upon there we started the notion of uh, beautiful kavya so subha sovistha the phrase the rigved 7565 there some handsomeness some beauty are being created and the root subh the root subh is given here and it has also connection to beauty and it has also connection to auspiciousness we use the word subh similarly tanvah subh mana tanvah subh mana rigveda 2392 there are subha and subha both of them are there meaning decorate to decorate and how usha is being described usha is a girl beautiful girl well decorated by her mother and this kind of decoration matru mrushta josha iba usha is matru mrushta mrush mrushta mrush ta pratya mrush dhatu to cleanse mrush to cleanse so matru mrushta she is cleansed by her mother she is decorated beautified by her mother rigved 1 1244 pariskrutam dev maneva chitram one uh, uh, purohito is uh, uh, describing the house of jajaman who gives him wealth regularly that uh, his house is pari pariskrita very well cleansed and chitra beautiful dev maneva like the temple of a god and uh, these things are uh, already uh, there and uh, uh, we all know that uh, these pariskara thing the exercise of pariskara has been done by uh, bharata in many places i will just give one example how poetry should be there and what should you do for your pariskara varjitam kavya dosheistu lakhana adhyam gunaatnitam swara alankara sanjuktam pathet pathyam jatha vidhi this is a kind of cleansing the poetry by uh, the poet सुश्लिष्टम संधि संयोगम सुप्रयोग सुखाश्रय मृदु शब्दाधानम च कवि कुरियातु नाटक इन अनदर प्लेस देर आर देर इज ए भेरी ब्यूटिफुल डेफिनेशन ही गिव्स ही डिफाइन्स पोएट्री हियर मृदु ललित पदार्थम हाउ इट शुड बी मृदु ललित पदार्थम गूढ़ शब्दाथहीनम बुधजन सुख भोग्यम युक्तिम नृत्य योग्यम बहुरसकृत मगम संधि संधान युक्त भवती जगति योग्यम नाटक प्रेक्षकाण सो दिस इज द प्रोसेस ऑफ क्लिंजिंग दिस इज द व्यापार ऑफ आस्थेटिशिजम इन इंडियन साइड एंड दैट वी आल्सो सो एंड द टोटल थिंग दैट दे सेड दैट प्लीजेंट डिसेप्शन बट द प्लीजेंट पार्ट इज रियली अपीलिंग बिकॉज दे आल्सो एक्सेप्ट दैट फॉर बीइंग प्लीज्ड audience is coming to drama hall auditorium so in this way there are many other places uh, many other uh, things i am not going into them i was uh, thinking that about a bliss i can say something but i have no time at all i have already crossed crossed 9 uh, minutes or just exact 1 uh, hour i talked and i am leaving it out it has a connection of uh, with uh, intuition and the uh, sublime so uh, i sum up this with this thank you very much and uh, surely uh, i will give this article if it is printed then the full article can be available to my friends thank you very much thank you so much sir it's a, a humble request from my students that uh, they are uh, smsing me i mean messaging me in my uh, mobile that if you kindly sum up your uh, lecture or purport 
of your lecture in just five minutes in Bengali language. It will be very much <laughs> beneficial to them. Please, sir. No, it is very, very difficult, but okay, another part I am going to say. Uh, only, only the uh, beauty part, if you kindly, be uh -huh. essence of beauty or aspects of beauty from the both. Uh, if you, uh, uh, you can all, also uh, focus on the Indian part only, if you please. Oh, yes, we can say. এটা কি হয়েছে যে সৌন্দর্য যে দোষদেরকে বার করে দিয়ে গুণ আর অলঙ্কারকে লাগালে এই পাঠটা মানে কাব্যটা সুন্দর হবে এবং যে কোনো আর্ট চিত্রও সুন্দর হবে যা দোষ সম্ভব চিত্রে সেগুলো করবে না আর যা সুন্দর এলিমেন্ট যা সব আছে উপাদান আছে তাকে লাগাবে তাহলে সুন্দর হবে চিত্র সেটা আরম্ভ থেকে বলে যাচ্ছে বামন বলে যাচ্ছে আমরা সবাই জানি স দোষ গুণ অলঙ্কার হানা দানা ভ্যাম হানো আর আদানো হানো মানে বার করে দেওয়া আদানো মানে গ্রহণ করে নেওয়া এইভাবে সৌন্দর্যটা হবে বলে সৌন্দর্য অলঙ্কার প্রসঙ্গে ও বামন বলে দিল তার আগে অনেক আমি শ্লোক যেগুলো লাস্ট দিকে পড়লাম সেগুলো হচ্ছে ভরতের ও কিভাবে সুন্দর কাব্য হচ্ছে সে বিষয়ে বলেছে আর সৌন্দর্যটা প্রকৃতির তা ভিতরে কিছু অধিকতা থাকা উচিত কি না তার উপরে প্রাচ্য পাশ্চাত্যতা মানে ইয়েরা সব আলোচনা করেছে তার কিছু সত্যতা আছে কি না মানে আমাদের যে নাট্য অনুভূতি সে অনুভূতি সে আনন্দের কিছু সত্যতা আছে কি না এ প্রসঙ্গ এসেছে আর এ প্রসঙ্গে সবাই মানে তার সত্যতা বিষয়ে বলার সময় অনেক সময় না এই যে অসত্য আনন্দ বলে পাশ্চাত্যে কিছু মনীষী বলেছে যে না এই যে কাব্য আনন্দ এ হচ্ছে অসত্য আনন্দ কিন্তু তার কিভাবে উত্তর এরা দিয়েছে আমাদের ভারতীয় কাব্যজ্ঞানা তার একটা আলোচনা আমি সংক্ষেপে করেছি অনেক কিছু আছে অ্যাকচুয়ালি মানে তোমরা যদি চাও কখন এই বইটা কিনে নাও তাহলে অনেক কিছু ডাটা পাবে বলে আশা করি আর তবে কাব্যের যে আনন্দ সেটাকে আমরা আনন্দ ভাবে যা উপনিষদে পেয়েছি রসবই সহ আর লব্ধানন্দী ভগতি পৈত্রীয় ইত্যাদি কথা প্রফেসর রাধাবল ত্রিপাঠীও বলেছেন সে যে আনন্দ সে আনন্দটাকে আমরা সুখ থেকে ভিন্ন বলে ভাবি সেটা ব্লিস সেটা এমনি জয় নয় সেটা হচ্ছে ব্লিস আর এই ব্লিস প্রসঙ্গেও অনেক কথা আছে কিন্তু অভিনব গুপ্ত আর অন্যদের যে একটা কাব্যিক ফ্রেজ আছে চিত্ত বিশ্রান্তি আমরা চিত্ত বিশ্রান্তি পাই চর্বণা সময় এ চিত্ত বিশ্রান্তি পাই যে যে মনটা যেমন হালকা হয়ে যায় আর কিছুই থাকে না আমাদের তো আছে যে যেখানে সুখ আর দুঃখ কিছুই থাকবে না সেইটা হচ্ছে আনন্দ বলে আমাদের ন্যায় তত্ত্ব আছে বেদান্ত তো থাকে আনন্দ বলেছে ন্যায় তত্ত্ব বলছে না আনন্দ না সুখ না দুঃখ যাই হোক এই যে প্রসঙ্গ চিত্ত বিশ্রান্তি প্রসঙ্গ তার উপরেও অনেকরা অভিনব গুপ্ত ইত্যাদিরা অনেক চিন্তা করেছে আর লঙ্গিনস বলে একজন গ্রিক দার্শনিক উনি একটা মানে ইয়ে ব্যবহার করেছেন ফ্রেজ পেরি হুপুস আন্ড পেরি হাইপোস অল্টারনেটিভলি উনি যে কোনো একটা ব্যবহার করলে হবে তার মানে হলো হাইয়েস্ট এলিভেশন যে হাইয়েস্ট এলিভেশন হয়ে যাচ্ছে আমরা কাব্যে পড়লে আমাদের মনের একটা উচ্চতা আসে যাচ্ছে সেইটা হচ্ছে ব্লিস সেইটা হচ্ছে আনন্দ বলে আমাদের সাহিত্যে বলা হচ্ছে আর উনিও লঙ্গিনস বলেন অন্যেরও অনেকরা বলেছে যদিও কবিদেরকে এইসব বাজে আনন্দ দিয়ে সাধারণ মানুষকে পথভ্রষ্ট করছে বলে প্লাটো উনার রিপাবলিকে লেখে উনার আইডিয়াল স্টেট যেটা উনি কল্পনা করেছেন সেখান থেকে কবিদেরকে নির্বাচিত করেছেন সে প্রসঙ্গ তো আলাদা কিন্তু এই যে আনন্দ ই একটা ব্রহ্মাস্বাদ সহোদর বলে আমরা তো জানি তাছাড়া অন্য মানুষরাও এটাকে সবলাইন বলে বলে সবলাইন মানে একটা হাইটেন ফিলিং একটা উচ্চাঙ্গ অনুভব আর সেই উচ্চাঙ্গ অনুভবের স্পর্শ আমরা সেই কারিকাতে পাই সাহিত্য দর্পণে সত্য উদ্রেকা অখণ্ড স্পর্শ কি সেটা সুপ্রকাশ আনন্দ চিন্ময় বেদ্যান্তর স্পর্শ শূন্য ব্রহ্মা স্বাদ সহোদর সেটা আমরা তা ভিতরে পাই যে মনটা সত্য ভাবে ভাবিত হয়ে যায় সত্য মানে কি রজস্তম অভ্যাম অস্পৃষ্টং মানহ সপ্তমী হচ্ছে রজ আর তম থেকে আলাদা হয়ে একটা সত্য ভাব যেটা তার আস্বাদন আমরা করি আর এইভাবে আমরা অনেক কিছু আনন্দ ভাবটাকে পাই আর এ ভিতরে আমি প্রকৃতে 
শ্রী অরবিন্দের কিছু তত্ত্ব দেবার চাইছিলাম সেটা দিচ্ছি না কিন্তু ঋগ্বেদে বলা হচ্ছে যে মনটা সবসময় চঞ্চল এটা শুধু চঞ্চলং হি মানহ কৃষ্ণ ভগবীতাতে বলা হচ্ছে বলে নয় ঋগ্বেদে বলা হচ্ছে বহুধা জীবত মানহ বিমে পুরুত্রা পতয়ন্তি কামা অনেক দিকে দৌড়ায় মন এই মনটাকে স্থির করে দিলে যাই কাব্য ভিতর থেকে আনন্দ পাওয়া যাবে এই স্থিরতার প্রসঙ্গটা কি এই স্থিরতার ট্রিকটা কি এটা আমি বলতে তো সেখানে আমি সময় পেলাম না এই স্থিরতাটা হচ্ছে যেহেতু তোমরা পঞ্চম স্বর্গ কুমার সময় পড়েছ সেইটা উদাহরণ দিয়ে বলছি পার্বতী বলছে না অত তুমি যে হে ব্রহ্মচারী শিবের নিন্দা করলে সেগুলো আমি শুনবো না কেন না মমাত্র ভাবে রসে মানহ স্থিতম নকাম বৃত্তির বচনীয় ইচ্ছতে আমার মনটা এখানে লেগে আছে মানে এখানে কনসেন্ট্রেটেড হয়ে গেছে কনসেন্ট্রেটেড হয়ে যাওয়ার কারণে আমি এখানে আনন্দ পাচ্ছি শিবের চিন্তন থেকে আনন্দ পাচ্ছি তাই আমি শিবকে বিয়ে করব তার মানে যে আমাদের প্রাচীন মানে ইয়ে আছে দার্শনিক ধারণা আছে যে ঋতম্ভরা তত্ত্ব প্রজ্ঞা বলে যোগশাস্ত্রে বলা হচ্ছে পতঞ্জলি বলছেন যে একটা হাইয়েস্ট স্টেট অফ কনসেন্ট্রেশন হয়ে গেলে আনন্দ জাগ্রত হয়ে যায় সেইটাই রসবই সহ সেই হাইয়েস্ট স্টেটটা আমাদের কাব্যে আনন্দ ভাবে আসে সেইটা হচ্ছে বিউটি তাকেই আমরা আস্বাদন করি আর কিছু বলতে যদি আছে তাহলে বলবো থ্যাংক ইউ সো মাচ আমি রিকোয়েস্ট করব যদি কারোর কোনো কোয়ারি থাকে আনমিউট করে তোমরা জিজ্ঞেস করতে পারো এখন আর পাঁচ মিনিট আমরা চালাতে পারি বাংলাতেও বলতে পারো কেউ যদি চাও বাংলাতেও বলতে পারো ইন এনি ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজ প্রফেসর মিশ্র ইজ কমফোর্টেবল অলমোস্ট ফাইভ আর সিক্স ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজেস I think there are some some people from audiences from Odisha also. So... Odia is going to go to Odia. So I think there are none. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your wonderful lecture. You have almost uh, touched all the aspects of beauty uh, from the Eastern part of our poetics and from the Western poetics also. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now we forward to um, our next session next lecture of this third academic session uh, let me introduce the speaker uh, professor siuli basu uh, she will be speaking on essence of propriety as reflected in sanskrit poetics with special reference to western thoughts western thoughts okay ochitto niye madam bolben তো আমি ম্যাডামকে আগে ইন্ট্রোডিউস করে দিই সবার জন্য প্রফেসর শিউলি বাসু রিসিভড হার ব্যাচেলার ডিগ্রি ইন সানস্ক্রিট ফ্রম বার্ডওয়ান ইউনিভার্সিটি ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ বার্ডওয়ান রাদার উইথ ফার্স্ট ক্লাস ফার্স্ট পজিশন দেন শি পারসিউড হার মাস্টার্স ইন সানস্ক্রিট লিটারেচার অ্যান্ড লিটারারি ক্রিটিসিজম ফ্রম বিশ্বভারত ইউনিভার্সিটি শান্তিনিকেতন আফটার দ্যাট শি হ্যাজ বিন অ্যাওয়ার্ডেড দ্য উইথ দ্য পিএইচডি ডিগ্রি পিএইচডি অ্যাওয়ার্ড ইন 2009 from the same university that is Vishwabharati University. Professor Vasu is serving the Department of Sanskrit of Jadapur University as a professor since 2021. Before that, uh, she served the same department as an assistant professor and uh, then as an associate professor from 2006 to 2021. She was also an assistant lecturer in Vishwabharati University from 2002 to 2006. Uh, numerous papers uh, has been uh, papers have been published by her mm, numerous books um, one is very much interesting and uh, worth mentioning that is uh, indian and western aesthetics a comparative study joint venture by professor vijaya goswami and our very own shivli madam uh, many awards and honors uh, have been received by professor basu uh, during her illustrious career. Some of these are Umacharan 
Sarvamangala medal for having uh, been placed first in the first class in Sanskrit honors by the University of Bardwan. And uh, other one is Rama Choudhury Memorial Prize for Best Paper in Classical Sanskrit Literature section in APSLA National Level Sanskrit Conference in December 2016. Now I request Professor Basu, my teacher, my madam uh, in Jadapur University uh, to deliver her lecture uh, on essence of propriety as reflected in Sanskrit poetics with special reference to Western thoughts. Professor Basu, Madam. Thank, thank you, Shomoji. And you know, I, I, I also request you to, to sum up your lecture also in Bengali if you. Okay, okay. For our students. Thank you, Madam. One minute. Thank you, Shomojit, and pronoun to Professor Onundanjo Misro Sir, and love to the audience. I want to thank the organizer and Shomojit, my beloved student, for inviting me in this webinar and giving me an opportunity to present a paper. Uh, to, today, I want to say something on the topic named Essence of Propriety as reflected in Sanskrit Poetics with special reference to Western thought. Uh, uh, at first, I want to say uh, the theory of Ochitto or property as reflected in Sanskrit poetics very shortly. Uh, the beauty of Sanskrit poetry depends on its harmonious appeal or maintenance of property. In the very first verse of Ochitto Vichara Chacha, Dothar Khemendra says, Kritari Banchane. Drishti yena yanyana moli moli nasa achutaya namat tashmai parma uchitta karine. Here the author has addressed the creator as parma uchitta karine. In the creation, the creator maintains harmony through destroying the enemies. So for the beautification of creation, this is an essential task of creator. Here it can be mentioned the famous saying of Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Yada Yadahi Dharmasya Glani Bhavati Bharata, Abhutthanam Adharmasya Tadatmanam Srijamyam. Uh, this Glani or Malinata or Malinasa is opposite to beauty. The author has meant that beauty depends on harmony. Harmony and beauty are correlated with each other. These two are dependent in poetry also. The proper representation of Palankaro, Chando, Bhasha, etc. Uh, in the poetry creates beauty and enhanced beauty. So, Khemendra has highlighted the theory of property in the text of Ochitto Vichara Charcha. In the Nata Shastra, uh, it is told that Nahi Rasadrite Kaschid Artha Pravartate. This Rasa is the main thing of poetry. Mammata also says, Rasascha Mukha. The beauty of poetry also depends on proper appeal of Rasa. So, Khemendra rightly has connected Rasa with Ochitta. He has said, Ochityasa Chamatkaro Karina Charu Charvane, Rasa Jibita Bhutasa Bicharam Kurute Othuna. Athava Ochityang Rasa Siddhyasya Stirang Kabyasa Jibitam. Relation between uh, uh, Khemendra has focused uh, various types of Ochitya. Uh, aesthetic, uh, aesthetics of poetry depends on proper use of Alankara, Guna, Riti, Dhoni, etc. Uchita Sthan, he says, the Uchita Sthan of Vinyasat, Alankriti, Alankriti. Ochityad, Achuta, Nityam, Bhavanteva, Guna, Guna. Here the author has repeatedly establish the inner relation between property and aesthetics with example. As it is said, Kanthe mekholaya nitamba phaloke tareno hareno ba 
পানো নুপুর বন্ধনে ন চরণে কেউর পা সে নবা সৌর্যে ন প্রণতে রিপৌ করুণয়া নয়ন্তিকে হাস্যতাম ঔচিত্যে ন বিনা রুচি বিনা রুচি প্রতনুতে নালঙ্কৃতির ন গুণা প্রপার অ্যারেঞ্জমেন্ট অফ অলঙ্কার ইন দ্য বডি ক্রিয়েটস বিউটি প্রপার বিহেভিয়ার ইন দ্য রাইট সিচুয়েশন মাস্ট অকার আদারওয়াইজ ইট উড বি রিডিকুলাস দাস খেমেন্দ্র ডিফাইন ঔচিত্য উচিত উচিত প্রাহুর আচার্য সদৃশং কিল উচিত ইয় ভাব তদ ঔচিত প্রচক্ষতে ইয়াত কিল ইয়ুরূপ তদ উচিত উচ্চতে তাবম ঔচিত্য কথয়ন্ত ইফ ইট ইস সার্চ ইন দ্য সংস্কৃত পোয়েটিক্স দেন ইট উইল বি নোটিসড দ্যাট দ্য প্রপ্রিয়েটি হ্যাজ আ রিলেশন উইথ দ্য সিক্স স্কুলস দ্যাট ইজ রস গুণ অলঙ্কার ধ্বনি বক্রতি নট অনলি সিক্স স্কুলস বাট অলসো এভরি অবজেক্ট অফ পোয়েট্রি আর কানেক্টেড উইথ প্রপ্রিয়েটি খেমেন্দ্র হ্যাজ ক্যাটেগরিক্যালি ডিভাইড টোয়েন্টি সেভেন টাইপস অফ প্রপ্রিয়েটি অর উচিত্ত পদ উচিত্ত বাক্য উচিত্ত প্রবন্ধ উচিত্ত গুণ উচিত্ত অলঙ্কার উচিত্ত রস উচিত্ত এটসেট্রা এটসেট্রা এমং দিস আই ক্যান ফোকাস টু অর থ্রি সাচ আস প্রবন্ধ উচিত হি হ্যাজ টোল দ্যাট উচিতার্থ বিশেষণে প্রবন্ধার্থ প্রকাশতে গুণ প্রভাব ভব্যেন বিভাবে নেব সজ্জন প্রবন্ধ প্রবন্ধ চিত্ত ডিপেন্ডস অন প্রপার অ্যাপ্লিকেশন অফ অ্যাডজেকটিভ ফর এক্সাম্পল ইট ইস কোটেড দ্য ভেরি নোন শ্লোক অফ মেঘদূত না জাতং বংশে ভুবন বিদিতে পুষ্করা আবর্তকা নাম জানামি ত্বং প্রকৃতি পুরুষং কাম রূপং মঘন প্রপার ইউজ অফ অ্যাডজেকটিভ কাম রূপং প্রকৃতি পুরুষম হেল্পস টু রিভিল দ্য লিভিং এন্টিটি অফ মেঘ খেমেন্দ্র হ্যাজ কোটেড ফ্রম কিরাত অর্জুনিয়ম ফর নিপাত ঔচিত্য হিতং মনহারি চ দুর্লভং বচ হি আর চ ইজ রাইটলি অ্যাপ্লায়েড নাও আই ফোকাস অন পদ ঔচিত্য ইট ইজ ভেরি ইম্পর্টেন্ট থিং ইন সাংস্কৃত পোয়েটিক্স খেমেন্দ্র হ্যাজ টোল্ড অ্যাবাউট পদ ঔচিত্য তিলকং বিভ্রতি শুক্তির ভাতি একম উচিতং পদম চন্দ্রাননেব কস্তুরীকৃত শ্যামেব চান্দনম ইসেজ অলসো একমেব উচিতং পদং তিলকয় তিলকায়মান বিভ্রানা শুক্তি সমুচিত পরো ভাগ শোভা অতিশয়ন রুচিরতাম আবহতি আওয়ার ট্র্যাডিশন আর ভেরি মাচ অ্যাওয়ার অব পদ প্রয়োগ উই নো দ্য ফেমাস সেইং অব বেদ এক শব্দ সুপ্রযুক্ত স্বর্গে লোকে কামদুগ ভবতি দ্য প্রেডিসেসার অব খেমেন্দ্র হ্যাভ অলসো ইলাবোরেটেড দ্য কনসেপ্ট অব পদ চিত্ত দণ্ডি সে হ্যাজ টোল্ড ইন দ্য কাব্যাদশ গৌর গৌ কামদুঘা সম্যক প্রযুক্তা স্মরজতে বুধই দুষ্প্রযুক্তা পুনর্গত্য প্রযুক্ত সৈব সংশতি ইন দ্য সাংস্কৃত পোয়েটিক্স দ্য কনসেপ্ট অফ পদ পাক ইজ ওয়েল নন ওয়েল ডিসকাসড বাই ভেরিয়াজ রেটোরিশিয়ান ইন দ্য ফিফথ চ্যাপ্টার অফ কাব্যমীমাংসা রাজশেখর হ্যাজ টোল তসমাৎ রসোচিত শব্দার্থ সুক্ত নিবন্ধন পাক ইয়ার দ্য টার্ম রসোচিত মাস্ট বি নোটেড the proper application of words are always desirable and it creates beauty of poetry rajeshekhar has delineated nine types of padopaka in the text kabbo mimangsha in the bakrakti jibita the author kuntaka has discussed padopaka by giving example from kumar sambhavam of kalidasa dayangata সম্প্রতি শোচনীয়তা সমাগম প্রার্থনায় কপালীন হেয়ার দ্য পোয়েট কালিদাস হ্যাজ ইউজ দ্য ওয়ার্ড কপালীন অ্যান্ড কুন্তক হ্যাজ জাস্টিফাইড ইট ইন হিজ ওন কমেন্টারি অত্র পরমেশ্বর বাচক শব্দ 
সহস্র সম্ভাবেওপি কপালিনাইতি বিভৎসরস আলম্বন বিভাব বাচক শব্দ যুগুপসা আস্পদ তৃণ প্রযোজ্যমান কামোপি বাচক বক্রতাং বিদাতি দ্য থট অফ ঔচিত্য আর প্রপ্রিয়েটি পারভেটস ইন এভরি কর্নার অফ সংস্কৃত পলিটিক্স দে আর সাম ইনস্ট্যান্সেস ক্যান বি মেনশন ভেরি শর্টলি ফ্রম নাট্যশাস্ত্র অ্যান্ড আদার টেক্সট ইন এভরি স্টেপ অফ নাট্যশাস্ত্র দ্য কনসেপ্ট অফ ঔচিত্য আর প্রপ্রিয়েটি হ্যাজ বিন ফোকাসড অ্যাকর্ডিং টু নাট্যশাস্ত্র দ্য ড্রামাটিস শুড প্রডিউস ড্রামা অ্যাজ পার লোকাল বিহেভিয়ার অ লোকযাত্রা ইট ইজ সেড দ্যাট দ্য যেসু দেশেসু ইয়া কার্যা প্রবৃত্তি পরিকীর্তিকা তদ বৃত্তিকানি রূপানি তেসু তজগ প্রযোজয় দিস ইজ রিলেটেড টু অভিনয় কস্টিউম শুড বি অ্যাকর্ডিং টু রস অ্যান্ড ভাব এতাদ বিভূষণং নার্জা আকেশাৎ অনখাদি যথাভাব রসাবস্থং বিজ্ঞায় এব প্রযোজয় অর্নামেন্ট মে বি অ্যাপ্লাইড অ্যাকর্ডিং টু দ্য নিডস অফ দ্য সিচুয়েশন দিস ইজ রিলেটেড টু আহার্য অভিনয় অ্যান্ড রুলস অ্যাবাউট অভিনয় বয় অনুরূপ প্রথম আস্তু বেশ বেশ অনুরূপশ্চ গতিপ্রচার গতিপ্রচার অনুগত পাঠ্য পাঠ্যানুরূপ অভিনয়শ্চ কার্য অদেশ হি বেশু ন শোভাং জনৈষতি মেখলা উরসি বন্ধে চাষায় উপজায়তে কেমেন্দ্র অলসো শেষ কণ্ঠে মেখলায়া হুইচ ইজ মেনশন বিফোর নাট্যশাস্ত্র অ্যাজ আফেল দ্য কনসেপ্ট অফ ঔচিত্য ইন দি রিপ্রেজেন্টেশন অফ ফোর টাইপস অফ অভিনয় দ্যাট ইজ বাচিক আহার্য আঙ্গিক সাত্বিক অ্যান্ড অ্যাপ্লিকেশন অফ ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজ অ্যান্ড আদার মেনি কেসেস এটসেট্রা সাম এক্সাম্পল অফ প্রপ্রিয়েটি ইন কাব্যালঙ্কার ভামহ ভামহ শেষ সন্নিবেশ বিশেষাত্তু দুরুত্তম অপি শোভতে নীলপলাশ নীলপলাস আবদ্ধ অন্তরালে সজামিব দ্য হার্স অর রুড ওয়ার্ড মে বি বিউটিফুল ইফ দিস প্লেসেস প্রপারলি অ্যাজ দ্য ব্লু পলাশ ক্যান বি বিউটিফুল ইন দ্য গার্লেন the whole sanskrit poetics always emphasize on the appeal of rasa for this purpose sometimes small changes of word or some faults have been ignored kabbadasa has also indicated some places of ochitya or appropriety there are some notable point that dondi has to different stand in explanation of kabbadasa Firstly, he has told any fault should not be desirable in the poetry. Tadalpam api no pekshan kabbe dushtan kathan chana shad bopu sundaram api shitre no eke no durhagam. After some times, Dondi has said again, Nunam api atra joi kaishit angai kabbyang na dushati jadi upatheshu sampatti aradhayati tadbita. If whole creation of poet are full of rasa, and if, can, if, if it can appeal sa-hridaya, then some faulty parts of it do not make any important issue. Some, some, uh, some approach has been noticed in the third chapter of Kabbadasa also. Kabbadasa affords this uh, with this verse, Viradha sakala apesha kadachit kobi kaushalat. প্রজত্নাধিগম্য সম্যক ঔচিত্যম আলোচ্য তথার্থ সংস্থান অরুণ মিশ্র স্যার অলরেডি সেট দিস মিশ্রা কবীন্দ্রই রচনা অল্প দীর্ঘা কার্যা মুহূর্তই মুহূর্তই চৈব গৃহীত মুক্তা অলঙ্কার ইচ্ছে মতো গ্রহণ এবং তাকে মোচন করার দরকার যদি সৌন্দর্য রক্ষার ক্ষেত্রে 
as per demand of the poem the poet should apply alankaro and this alankaro can be adapted or rejected for the purpose of beautification of poem this uh, view can be observed or noticed also in the dhanyaloka vibakhya tat paratteno nangittena kadachana kale cha grohana tyagau nati nirvahano uchita mamata also says that rasasai pradhanyat nalankarata kabya lankaro of rudrata also upholds the notion of uchitya in explanation of the kabya dosho and the kadosho and uh, this false or dosho can create beauty if this place is properly by the poet as it is said bhaktiya harsha bhaya divi akhipta pramana tatha stuban nindan jat padam asakrit bruat tat punaruktam na doshayo now dhanyaloka can be focused it is well known to all that ananda vardhana has elaborately discussed about the theory of uchitya or property and khemendra has been inspired by his this thought of dhanyaloka by which he upholds the theory of alankar uchit प्रसिद्ध उचित्य बंधस्तु रसस्य उपनिषद पड़ा Here the author has beautifully connected uchitya and rasa. Another view, important view regarding alankara, must be noted as the Nalaka affords that rasa kipto taya yasa bandho shakko kiyo bhavet apritak jatno nirvarta salankara dhano vato. Thus the Nalaka mainly established rasa uchitya again and again. Uh, while explaining other theories for example in the explanation uh, of sanghatana it is told that chondhi sandhanga ghatanam rasa rasa vibhakto apekshaya natu kevalaya shastra sthiti sampadana ichchaya athava raso yada pradhannena pratipadya tat pratito vyavadhayaka virodhinascha sarvatmana eva pariharja so it is clear that ananda vardhana has focused on raso obhinav gupta obhinav gupta's thought is similar with ananda vardhana as he also upholds raso uchitya as it is said kotoko keura divhirapi sharira samabais chetana atmaivo tat chitta vritti vishesh uchitya vishesh uchitya suchanatmo taya alankritaye तथा ही अचेतन शव शरीर कुंडलादिपेतमी न भाति अलंकार अभाव अलंकार व्यवहार प्रधान नियम हम आत्मगत चित्त वृत्ति विशेष औचित्य से औचित्य अनुसार ही अलंकार व्यवहार है देहे निजे को औचित्य अनौचित्य नहीं अभिनव गुप्त हेज हाइलैटेड आदार एनदार इम्पर्टेंट थिंग हिज कनेक्टेड अनौचित्य उथ रसा भाष अनौचित्यन तदा भाष रावण से सीतायाम इवरते नेक्स्ट द टेक्स्ट ऑफ दशरूपक रिटन बाय धनंजय इन द 10th सेंचुरी मे बी ऑब्जर्वड दशरूपक अफोल्ड्स द आइडिया ऑफ औचित्य और प्रॉपर्टी इलैबोरेटली सच एज इट इज सेड यत तत्र अनुचितं किंचित नायक नायक रसर क्षेत्र इन्सिडेंट डु नट मैच उरो और डु नट मैच उन रस अब ड्रामा देन ड्रामाटिस कैन चेन्ज इट Such as in the drama of Udatta Raghava, the dramatist has rejected the incident of Bali Bada Brittanta, as this incident would not be appropriate 
because it indicates the immoral behavior of the hero, Rama. But dramatists want to project higher qualities of hero so that the name of the drama Udatta Raghava can be justified. Another drama, Mahavira Charito, where the dramatist Bhavabhuti also wants to highlight the higher qualities of the hero Rama. So this particular incident, Balibadha Vrittanto, has been changed by the poet. The poet has projected that Bali, the friend of Ravana, has come to Rama for killing him. So for the protection of himself, Rama has killed Bali. So the character of Rama can remain pure. Here it is observed that for the maintenance of the property or justification of the name of the drama, Udatta Raghava or Mahavir Charito, the dramatist has projected the incident other way or changed the incident, which is focused in the Balmiki Ramana, which is considered Itihasa. Itihas Balmiki Ramana, Jeta Bola, Jaya Bola, Jaya Balibadu Brittanto, Shetake, Dramatis Ichamoto, Puribatun Koreditsin, Uchitur Kajuno, Natoke, Jenam Korun, Tashate Uchitur Kajuno. Sita Bangla, the Mignad Bot Kabo, Mudushudono, Koresin, Baoneki Kore. The Uchiturok and Natoke, Nam Korone, Uchiturok Kashate, Amra, Rama and Mavarate Golpo, Puribatun Koresin. Koresin. In the Bakrok Tijibita, Kuntako has viewed Ochitta as Guna. Tad Ochitta Nama Guna. He says, Anjasena Sabhavasya Mahatang Yena Pasate. Prokarena Tad Ochitta Uchita Khana Jibitam. Yatra Boktu Pramaturba Bachang Shobhati Shaina Aschat Date Shabhavena Tad Ochitta Muchati. Here the author has meant that the beauty of any literary creation depends on Ochitya. While discussing Bakrata, he has connected it with Ochitya. He has discussed Varno Bakrata, which focused that uh, which focused the theory of Ochitya. Varnanto Jogino Sparsha Dirukta Talonadayo Shishtascha Rashadi Sangjukta Prostuto Ochitya Shovino. The Borno must apply according to the Rasa. Not only uh, this, Kuntako has delineated other Bakrata and he has connected it with Uchitta. Mohim Bhatta, the author of Bhakti Viveka, has uh, also thrown the light on Uchitta in the text Bhakti Viveka. He has explained two types of Anuchitya. Arthan Anuchitya, Sabdan Anuchitya. He has also told, same like Ananda Vardhana, Anuchitya Adrite Nanyat Rasabhangasya Karanam, Prashiddha Uchitya Vandhastu, Rasasya Upanishad Pura. So, thought of Uchitya is well known to all the Sanskrit rhetorician, and the whole discourse of poetics is for embellishment of poetry, and without Uchitya, this embellishment cannot be possible. Kemenra systematically gathered uh, various types of Uchitya uh, in the Uchitya Vichara Charcha. Before this text, the theory of Uchitya has been flourished by the rhetorician also. Now I uh, concentrate uh, some Western thought. In this discussion, some thought of Western aesthetic may be observed. Here I concentrate on the theories of Plato, Aristotle, and Horace. Plato uh, thought about poetic inspiration, imitation, and his condemnation of poetry are also great historical significance. Poetic inspiration or uh, power divine of Plato. According to Plato, there is no invention in him until he has been inspired. Plato's opinion is that the poet signs not by his art, by power divine. 
Saskia Tetrarician has told about Noishargiki Pratibha. So poet must have this quality. Dondi has told about Noishargiki Pratibha. Not only Dondi, other rhetorician of Sanskrit also told about Pratibha. This Pratibha can be compared with the thought of power divine. This Pratibha is inborn quality of poet. Noishargiki Praktano Janmu Shidhya Ittartha Pratibha Shokti Samaskar Avishesha. Sanskrit poetics as well as Western thought, the poet should have inborn quality. The theory of imitation of Plato. The Plato is not servile imitation. Poetry is not servile imitation of imitation or copying. It is creative. Poetry is creative, and it is the poet's view of reality that we get from it, him, and not reality itself. Imitation is the essential characteristic of all arts. The common character of all arts should be mimesis or imitation. We can find the theory Onukarana Vada in Sanskrit poetics also. The theory of imitation is shown in uh, Drishya Kabya or Natya. Dasarupaka says, Avasthar Anukriti Natyam Rupang Drishyataya Uchate. Shaita Darpana says, Bhaved Abhinaya Avastha Anukara Sachatur Vida. Many uh, uh, dramatists have so told this. Plato's thought that the artist must select or organize his material. He must have knowledge of the rules and technique of his art. He must study and exercise and he must learn which, is, which are essential. This thought is quite similar with Bhutpati or Nipunata and Obhyasa. Most of the Sanskrit rhetorician think that poet must have Bhutpati or Nipunata and Obhyasa. Bhutpati or Nipunata is nothing but proper knowledge achieved by poet before writing something. Ratsekara says Uchito Anuchito Viveka Bhutpati. Organic unity of Plato. According to Plato, organic unity is essential for success of for all arts. He compares a work of art with the with a living organism. Artistic unity means a harmonious interrelation of the different parts and no parts should be changed or omitted without an injury to the whole work. This artistic unity can be observed in the concept of Kabya Sandhi or Natya Sandhi in the Sanskrit dramaturgy. Antaraikartha Samyandhas, Sandhi Rekarnaya Shati or Ekeno Dasurupaka says this, Antaraikartha Samyandhas, Sandhi Rekarnaya Shati Ekena Prajaneno, Unitana, Kathang Sanam, Avantaroiko Prajana Samando, Sundi. This harmonious, harmonious interrelation can be focused in the Nata Sundi and Kabo Sundi. Quality of critic. According to Plato, a critic must have courage, knowledge, and wisdom. Among the Saskit poetician, rhetorician, Ratshakara has emphasized on this matter. He has affirmed that qualities of critic, Bhavaitri Pratibha. Uh, according to Rajsekhar, there are four types of Bhavaitri Pratibha critic, Arachakina or Vivekina, Srinabhya Vaharinascha or Vivekina, Matsharina, Pratibhatam api, na Pratibhatam, Parogunyeshu, Bhatam, Yamatvat, and Tatyavhineshi. Tatyavhineshi tu madhye shahasram yadi eka. Rasekara says. Rasekara has highly praised this type of critic. Tatyavhineshi. Sabdanam vivinakti gumphanam vidhinam amadate shukti vi shandrang leri rasamritam vichunute tatparja mudrang chaja punnai shanghatate vivikti 
বিহরাত অন্তর্মুখ তাম্যতাম কেশামেব কদাচিত এসো সুধিয়াম কাব্য শ্রমজ্ঞ জন দিস প্রেস ইমপ্লাইজ দ্যাট রাজশেখর ওয়ান্টস দ্যাট ক্রিটিক মাস্ট বি তাতিয়াভিনেশি Next, I concentrate on Aristotle. The Aristotle was a versatile author. Here, now it is mentioned on uh, only poetics. The book consists of 26 chapters. Now, discussion has been dealt with the property as focused in the book, uh, poetics, with a comparative manner. Some rules of tragedy can be compared with the theory of Sanskrit dramaturgy on the basis of property. Aristotle enumerates uh, four or six formative elements of a tragedy. That is plot, character, diction or language, thought, spectacle and song. Plot and character are medium of imitation. Diction is the manner of imitation. Thought, spectacle and song are the object of imitation. According to Aristotle, tragedy imitates action. By plot, Aristotle means the arrangement of incident. Incident means action. Tragedy is an imitation of action, both external and internal. The plot should consist a logical and inevitable sequence of event. The action should imitate its plot. The action must be complete. It must have a beginning, a middle and end. Saskia Dramaturgy also says about dramatic plot which must divide in Panchavastha, Artho Prakriti, Panchashandhi. It is said in the Dasarupaka. অনৌচিত্য রস বিরোধ পরিহার পরিশুদ্ধিকৃত সূচনীয় দর্শনীয় বস্তু বিভাগ ফলানুসারেন উপক্লিপ্ত বীজ বিন্দু পতাকা প্রকারী কার্য লক্ষণা অর্থ প্রকৃতিক পঞ্চাবস্থা অনুগুণ্যেন পঞ্চধা বিভাজে অ্যাকর্ডিং টু অ্যারিস্টোটল টু শর্ট অ্যাকশন cannot be regarded as proper and beautiful and neither should it be too long for in that case it will not be taken in as an artistic whole by the memory. The action should be proportionate in the relation of the different parts to each other and to the whole. Saski Dramaturgy does not directly describe the length of action but through the description of various avasthas, sundhis, it is implied that the dramatic action should not be too long or too short. It must have certain measurement. Aristotle has emphasized the unity of action. He is against plurality of action as it weakens the final effect of the tragedy. Aristotle clearly states that this unity of plot cannot arise merely by the presence of a single hero. A wide variety of incidents might befall a single individual in life. All of them cannot go into the making of the plot. The artist must properly select and order his material, thus impart artistic unity to it. Saski Dramaturgy also afford the similar thought as it is said bichinna avantara ikartha kinchit sanglagna binduka yukta na bohuvi karjoi bija sanghriti manna cha according to aristotle character must be good but not too good or perfect weak character may be introduced if required by the plot secondly they must be appropriate. By appropriateness, Aristotle means that they must be true to type. Thirdly, they must have likeness. By likeness, Aristotle may mean character must be true representative of actual human nature. 
Fourthly, they must have consistency. Sanskrit dramaturgy also describes various types of character, that is, four types of Nayaka, eight types of Naikas, other female and female characters, but they are quite stereotyped. Thought is the intellectual element in a tragedy, and it is expressed through the speech of character. Speeches must be significant as it expresses the views and feelings of a character. Language affords the thoughts and feelings of the various dramatic personality. It is through speech that their character is first revealed. Sanskrit dramaturgy does not directly speak about thought, but Bhachika Abhinaya is an important thing through which thought and language of particular character must be expressed. It is quite known to all that language of drama has been well discussed in Sanskrit dramaturgy. These languages are Sanskrit, various types of Prakrit, etc. And other languages have been introduced as per characters. Now I focus on Horace. Uh, his book name is Ars Poetica. The subject matter of this book clearly falls into three oil mark division. First, there is poesis or the discussion of the subject matter of the of poetry. Secondly, there is poema or form. The third part is poeta or the poet. In this part, he gives advice to the poet regarding his art and also examines the function of poetry. Horace opened his first section with some significant introductory remarks on the need of observing organic unity and property. Arts Poetica opens with the ascertain that poem must have organic unity. The poet is free to indulge his fancy, but he must not create monster or impossible figure. There must ex exist a harmonious relation, the parts and the whole. The organic unity of poem can be found in the theory of Sanskrit dramaturgy and Sanskrit poetics also. The concept of Natya Sandhi and Kabbe Sandhi proves that the subject matter should proceed to ultimate goal. Each and every Sandhi is connected with ultimate goal, Mukha Phalo. So the words Nato Phalo Pradhan Upayasya or Mukha Phalo has been used in discussing the various Sandhi. According to Horace, the plot should be based on uh, old familiar uh, stories. This is quite similar with the thought of Saski dramaturgy, as it is said, Natakam Khatavitta. And according to Horace, entirely new themes may also be invented if an old story is chosen. A slavish imitation of all the details is not necessary, but care should be taken. This reshaping process must be free from inconsistencies or absurdities. The same uh, thought can be found in the Dhanya Loko. Drishta Purba Pihi Artha Kabbe Raso Purigrahat Sarve Nabaiva Abhanti Mudhuma Saiva Druma. According to Horace, the dramatist must know what to represent on the stage and what to re report to the audience. Ugly and horrible incidents should happen off the stage. Sanskrit poetics also upholds the almost same theory through orthopokshapaka. Didha vibhaga kartavya sarvasya piha vastuna shucha meva bhavet kinchit drishya sravya mathaparo Nirasa Anuchito Tatra Shamsucha Vastu Vistaro Drishastu Mothuro Udatto Rasobhava Nirantar Dasrupa says. Saito Darpan also says the Ankesha Adarshaniya Javakta Bhivacha Sammata 
याष पर्यत कथादीन दया दिजा अन्या च विस्तरा सूचा छुच्चा सार्थव क्षेपक बुधई अकॉर्डिंग टू हरेस द ड्रामा शुड नट हाव मोर और लेस दैन फाइव एक्ट संस्कृत ड्रामा डी अल्सो शेष पंचाधिका दशो पड़ा तत्रंका परिकृति and horace also says meter should be used as per subject matter this chando chitya uh, also has been found in the sanskrit poetics as kemendra has told in the shubritta tilaka in his text shubritta tilaka uh, prabandha sutarang bhati jatha sthanam vivechaka nirdashai guna sangyuktai shubrittai mukta koi mukti koi riva काव्ये रसानुसारेण वर्णनाुगुण पूर्वी तो सर्ववृत्तिया अकॉर्डिंग टू हरेस द आर्ट ऑफ पोएट्री रिक्वायर्स लेबर्स लॉन्ग एंड पार्सिस्टेंस पॉलिस्ड वर्कमैनशिप ए पोएम शुड बी रिभाइज सेभरल टाइम्स until it attains artistic excellence sanskrit poetics also have highlighted that the poet must have three qualities that is inner potentialities which is already told noishargiki uh, pratibha learning utpatti or nipunata and practice most of the sanskrit rhetorician have emphasized on pratibha and accept other as a subordinate cause this is uh, this has been already discussed according to horace minor faults in poetry may be forgiven a poet should try avoid faults as much as he can if there is much that sign in a poem a few blemishes will not offend the reader sanskrit rhetorician has focused on dosha sometimes old rhetorician are very rigid about the existence of dosha we uh, already dis- uh, discussed the dondi says tadalpam api no pekshan kabbe dushtam kathanchana but later rhetorician have somehow different view as they accept minor faults if the poem is full of rasa as it is found in the saitya darpana kitanu vidya ratnaadi sadharanena kavyata dushte shopi mata yatra rasaadi anugama sphuta and according to horace the language of poetry should be different from the language of common man horace also points out that the style and meter should vary according to the character and the circumstances distinction of age sex social standing must be reflected in the language which is uh, which the character use sanskrit rhetorician also talk about poetic language as bhamoho says soisa sarvaiva vakrakti or kuntako says vaidagdho bhungi bhuniti Sanskrit rhetorician also talk about bhasha utchitto elaborately. So, uh, in spite of various differences between Sanskrit poetics and Western thought, but for the maintenance of propriety, the attitude of both are same. Professor Radha Vallab Tripathi sir has said in the keynote address, "Beauty lies in removing the excess." or beauty lies in certain measurement or in some discipline and rabindranath uh, says it ka sangyama uh, so at the end of the discussion again the light can be thrown on ochitya and sondarjo propriety and aesthetics it is already discussed that these two are correlated or interrelated this discussion of propriety in the poetry indicates the normativity or the discipline uh, 
the normativity also can be noticed in the ethics and aesthetics these two normatives of philosophy are core are also very closely related so propriety ethics and aesthetics are connected with each other we can conclude with some great saying of rabindranath tagore from sahitya prabandho uh, rabindranath bolchen je gyaner bhitti jodi shokto na hoito tobe to she kebol khap chhara shopno hoito ar anonder bhitti jodi shokto na hoito tobe to she she kebol khap chhara shopno hoito ar anonder bhitti jodi shokto na hoito tobe taha nitantoi paglami hoya utito ei je shokto bhitti ihai songjom ihar moddhe bichar ache bol ache tag ache सौंदर्य के पुरो मात्रा भोग करते गई संयम प्रयोजन सौंदर्य सृष्टि कराओ असंजत कल्पना वृत्तर कर्म नहे दृष्टान दिए कवि समस्त घरे आगुन लागैया दिए दिया केह सन्ध्या प्रदीप जालाय एकटूते ही आगुन हाथ बाहर हा जाए बलिया घर आलो करीते आगुने ऊपर दखल रखा चाय यार बलार विषय छो जो औचित्य रक्षार जो मेजारमेंट बा माँ परिमिति बोधाई हे सब बड़ कथा और यहाँ पाश्चात्य संस्कृत पोएटिक्स कब्यशास्त्रे बार बार ही से कथाई बला आ थैंक यू थैंक यू सो माच मैडम फर दिस वारफुल लेक्चर ऑन प्रपरारिटी दैट इज औचित्य फ्रम द फ्रम as reflected in sanskrit poetics and as well as in western uh, poetics now thank you so much if anyone present here has any questions or query please unmute yourself and ask to madam bangla theo keu bolte pare jaile खुब सुंदर लगल खुबी सुंदर लगल खुब विशेषत पीपीडी टो भलो लगलो सुंदर गोछानो छो खूब भलो लेगे थैंक यू सो माच थैंक यू थ्री अफ आर एकडेमिक सेटेड नाउ इट्स टाइम फर uh two paper presentations uh ma'am if you have time then i request you to uh, to be present if you have time or if you have any other work to do then you can you may leave also whatever you want. okay okay then we are moving ahead uh, our first uh presentation paper presentation uh is by Mr. Shubhadeep Das. He is a PhD research scholar depart, uh, of the Department of Sanskrit and Philosophy of Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda Educational and Research Institute, uh, formerly uh, known as Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda University, Belur Mot, West Bengal. Uh, the title of his paper today is a comparative study of dhoni and sublime theory. Now I request uh, Shubhadeep Das to to deliver his paper. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, clear. Okay. Can you see my screen, sir? Just a minute.
No. Please present your screen again. Okay. Yeah, he's coming. Yes, yes. Now we can see. Yeah. Start. Okay, so thank you. Sharada, Sharadam, Hoja, Vadana, Vadanam, Buje, Sarvada, Sarvadas, Makam, Sanidhim, Sanidhim, Kriyat. My pranams to all the professors present here. Uh, my name is Subhadip Das, I am a research scholar in Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda Educational and Research Institute. So I will present my paper today named A Comparative Study of Dhani and Sublime Theory. As the East and West are geographically two different parts of the world, their evolution in philosophy also distinct from each other. In the history of poetics, both East and West produced some great scholars who analyzed literary works and found out some great theories of it. We often find vivid differences between the philosophical perspectives of Eastern and Western critics as the poetic style and taste are varying between them and so they are philosophical aspects. But it's not same always and Dhani theory of East and sublime theory of with are the instance of it. These two theories are talking about the grandeur of poetry and aesthetic experience. If we go through these theories, we can find some noticeable similarities and that pushed me to write this paper comparing these two theories of two renowned critics of East and West in every aspect. So, Firstly, we will discuss Anandavardhana and his Dhani theory. In Indian aesthetics, there are various schools who have put forward various theories about the aesthetics and among them, the chief schools are Alankara, Rasa, Riti, Guna, Dhani, Vakrokti, Auchitya, etc. enforced by the great ancient scholars like Bharata, Dhamaha, Vamana, Udhvata, etc. So Dhani theory is an important theory in Indian literary tradition. Anandavardhana, a well-known Kashmirian poet and philosopher, firstly used the term Dhani. He is the first one in Indian poetics who attempts an inquiry into semantics and asks basic questions relating aesthetics and semantics and answers them systematically like a philosopher. Thus, he goes far beyond the popular literary theories and starts a new tradition in the history of Alankara literature. Dhvani is a semantic theory that means it deals with the meanings of words. As a preliminary to his explanation of the essence of poetry, he told the difference between two well-known usages of language That is uh, Bachyartha and Lakshyartha. The first one is the literal meaning of a word which is in the reach of everyone who knows the language. The second one is the indirect use of language wherein the meaning uh, either may be metaphorical or implicit. Poetry is limited to these two meanings before Anandavardhana. But he explains that poetry starts from these two levels of meanings and it doesn't stop here. Poetry is beyond of these two meanings and that is Vengyartha. It is the suggested or hidden meaning of the word which is the soul of the poetry. The aesthetic experience is absolutely impossible without it. For example, when we say he lives in the library, literal meaning of this sentence is understood by everybody. But here the suggested meaning is 
that boy or man loves to read the books so he is often seen in the library and that's why the sentence is told about him this implicit meaning of the sentence is totally different from the literal meaning and can't be understood by everybody in this aspect we can quote a poem that is bhramadharvika bisrab tha sa shunakodya maritastena goda nadi kachcha kunja vasina dripta simhena ramble freely pious man that dog today is killed by the fire lion that dwells in goda river dells it is a shloka of hala kavi from gatha saptashati the literal meaning of the poem is positive that is the pious man can ramble freely but the suggested meaning is negative that is the pious man is prohibited from the from rambling freely here the lady is prohibiting the man indirectly and that creates the charming sense in this poem thus the implicit aspect of this poem is totally opposite from the explicit aspect and that suggested meaning makes the poem beautiful so anandavardhana discusses the dhvani theory uh, in his major work dhvanya loka it is divided into four chapters and each of the chapter called uddyota at the beginning of this book he summarizes the purpose of writing this book he tells the soul of the poetry has already been recognized and that is dhvani the word dhvani is used for five different meanings and each of the meaning is grammatically right these meanings are uh, dhvanati iti dhvani hi vachaka shabda that means word which is suggesting dhvanati iti dhvani hi vachaka artha that means meaning which is suggesting dhvanyate iti dhvani hi vyanyartha that means meaning which is suggested dhvananam dhvani hi that means suggestion is vyanjana and dhvanati asmin iti dhvani hi that means uttama kavyam poetry consisting suggestion so anandavardhana used the term dhvani in every five possible meanings and i also follow him so readers have to understand the meaning according to the context another significant feature of this suggested meaning is that we can't understand this meaning by reading some part of the poem unlike the literal meaning we have to read the whole poem to understand it and only then we can come to experience the aesthetic value of that creation for example i will quote some lines uh, from uh, robert uh, of robert browning from my love duchess he said i gave comments all smiles stop together okay if we read these lines separately i gave comments so that's mean someone gave some orders and after that all smiles stop together that means some people stop their smile but when we read the lines together and know the context we get the suggested meaning that is one of the character of the poem duke is uh, giving order to kill the duchess and that's why everybody stops smiling so thus he suggest the suggested meaning we get from the whole poem is more than the literal meaning and only can be understood by the man of taste somebody who simply knows words and grammar and focused on that can't be able to know the suggested meaning of the poem one must be the man of the taste uh, or sahridaya to know this meaning and experience the extreme happiness of prasa in indian poetry the old schools gave importance to direct meaning this was there was no place of suggested meaning in this school but according to new school poetry cannot be expressed completely using words it must consist in direct method or expression uh, they told that the beauty of poetry depends on the importance given to suggested meaning and anandavardhana was the first among them they divided poetry into three types depending upon the suggested meanings it had the three types are uh, dhvani kavya aur uttama kavya guni bhuta vyanga kavya aur madhyama kavya chitra kavya aur adhama kavya the poetry in which the words and the literal meanings occupy a subordinate position and suggest some charming sense is called dhvani kavya 
the poetry in which the suggested meaning is present but takes a subordinate position that literal than literal meaning is called gunibhuta vyangya kavya the poetry in which no suggested meaning exists is called chitra kavya it is the lowest type of poetry chitra kavya dhvani kavya is the highest type of poetry so now we will focus on the next longinus and this sublime theory okay on the sublime is a work of western literary criticism while the author of it is not definitively known longinus or pseudo longinus is typically credited for it he wrote this book by analyzing both strong and weak writing from works written over the previous 1000 years and set the goal for a good poem that is to achieve the sublime in philosophy the sublime is a quality of greatness it can be physical intellectual moral aesthetic or spiritual here it is important to note that the use of the english word sublime and all its philosophical associations with that accompany arise from multiple translations but the word truly means the essentials of a noble and impressive style according to ranjainas bravery is necessary to take risks and taking risks is necessary to reach the sublime although ranjainas is criticized for working tediously in on the sublime the concept of reaching the sublime becomes a major goal afterwards and the essential part of poetry in every pass- passing year in one sentence sublime is a kind of loftiness and excellence in language which raises the style of ordinary language it should be recognizably different and excellent in composition but it is not enough for sublimity it must have the power to move the readers along with the effects of pleasure and persuasion such effects should be like a thunderbolt in the say in the sense sublime is lofty and excellent poetic creation with power to please persuade and move the readers through the upliftment of their souls by rhetorical mastery of the writers according to longina sublimity is achieved by a skillful handling of two things nature and art nature means inborn genius and art means learned skills thus for sublimity author have to be genius and skillful as well the five sources he mentioned for sublime are either related to author or poem these are great ideas genuine emotion formation and figure of speech novel diction great composition so firstly great ideas okay the first essential source of sublime is great ideas in author lofty and natural expression is possible when there are noble and lofty thoughts poor idea can never uplift the soul of the reader the great thoughts come from the imagination of a great creative genius mind and make a great creation through the vivid use of imagery or and rhetoric next genuine emotion the second source of sublime is the genuine emotion the emotion should be strong and natural and it must be expressed in lofty and elevated language because only then it can move the readers with pleasure and persuasion third that is formation and figure of speech so uh, it is uh, for sublime uh, is the it is the poetic use of language okay if the formation and figure of speech are proper, pro- properly used then it boosts the elevated expression such a use of figures should not be mechanical and forceful they should be genuine and natural as per the demands of the contextual environment in short the use of figures must be physical and intimately connected with thoughts and emotions of author here we can quote few lines of r parthasarathi it she said across the sea is a new knowledge sudden and unobtrusive unobtrusive unobtr- unobtr- as first snow transforming the landscape rinses speech affords the brown skin and the heart beating to a different rhythm here the poet says that as with the change in the season circle snow converts the appearance and causes a better and pleasure giving sight all around the landscape similarly a new understanding of himself and of indian 
with the intention of identifying himself with the indian society totally after passing a year in england emerged in parthasarathi's mind thus new emergence of parthasarathi's soul has been compared to snow due to common factors thus using the figures of speech that is simile the pro- poetry moves the readers with the expression of pleasure and persuasion and achieves the sublimity the fourth is uh, novel diction so uh, it means choice and arrangement of words longinus says that the writer should use proper and striking words according to context and emotion because it can hold the attention of the hearers the fifth one and the last one is great composition uh, the verbal order should be uh, rhythmic and tuneful which helps to move the reader with persuasion and pleasure such a composition appeals to the soul and enables the readers to participate in the emotions of the author and the readers come to know the actual significance of the poem for example we can quote a shloka that is sikharini kvanunama kiyachiram kimavidhanam asa vakaro tapah taruni yena tavadhara patalam dashati bimbakalam shuka savakah on which mountain for and for how long did this one perform penance and what might be its name for the young parrot takes the, the fruit so red as your lips there the lover is trying to say his lady about the about his desire to kiss her but he has not the courage to say it so he expressing his desire by tasting the lips of her that is kissing her lips is only possible for those who did lot of virtuous action and that's true through describing a certain circumstances here the author with the with his great idea wrote this excellent and extraordinary poem using his skill and power of composition and reading it we became moved with the effects of pleasure so we can say that the author is able to create sublimity in this poem so here anandavardhana gives a large number of illuminating examples from the best writings in sanskrit literature in his major work dhanyaloka and shows the implicit meaning present there to establish his dhani theory longinus also quote the writings of great western writers like homer as an example of sublime but here we quote quoted sanskrit poetry as an instance of sublime and english poetry as an instance of dhani through this intertextual study we can conclude that the poetry without dhani doesn't achieve sublimity and bhaish bharsa for instance we can quote a shloka that is prarthayate yah pidam anubhavati bhange api madhuro yadi ha sarvesha miha khalu vikaro yahi matah na samprapto vriddhim yadi sa vrishamakshetra patitah kimikshor dosho so na punar lagunaya maruhava maruhuvah if that which suffers pain or other sick and remains sweet through brook in twain if that whose various deformities to are held to be ever pleasing falls on a barren soil and fails to grow is it the mystic of the sugar cane and not at all of the worthless desert uh, here the author describes the qualities of a saint by describing the qualities of sugar cane the meaning of the poem is quite evident to all there is no suggested meaning present and after understanding the meaning we can feel any kind of pleasure so dhvani and sublimity both are missing here and it is a hint to their identity we found some other similarities between they, these theories as well and these are poetry which consists dhvani leads the reader to the rasananda which is almost like the thriller of brahmananda and sublime is lofty and excellent poetic creation which has the power to please the reader so both dhvani and sublime uplift our soul and take us to a miraculous pleasure in dhvani theory figure of speech and rhythm can play a significant role in aesthetic experience longinus also mentioned figure of speech and composition as a source of the sublime and we showed it before according to anandavardhana the third one according to anandavardhana the primary meaning can be understood by all but the suggested meaning is understood only by those 
was get literary taste and are gifted with some imagination and a sort of intuitive intuition and who knows how to recognize the essence of poetic meaning longina also said the sublimity can be understood by everybody one must be the man of taste to understand that uh, fourth one longina started uh, stated that a strong writer will not focus on his own emotions or trying to convey emotions but rather to cause the reader to feel those emotions in addition longinus admires genius in writing he mentions specific writers like homer sappho plato uh, and uh, aristophanes and their ability to create the sublime by causing readers to feel pleasure anandavardhana seconds longinus he told that when the reader can feel the emotion of the poet by reading his poetry then it becomes successful as example he took the name of great indian authors like valmiki vyasa kalidasa etc uh, fifth one the source of sublime mentioned by longinus and the causes of dhvani mentioned by anandavardhana are almost identical uh, sixth one and the last one discussing the sources of true sublime longinus described the factors of false sublime like puerility defects of style bombastic use of language etc In the third chapter of his book, Anandavardhana also describes the canon propriety, which decides the success or failure of a poet. So, at last, we can say literature is incomplete without literary criticism. Like words, in, the word is incomplete without its meaning, because criticism not only helps the reader to understand and appreciate poetry better, but it also offers valuable guidance to the poet. by laying down the basic principles of poetic creation longinus of west and anandavardhana of east are two big names in the poetics who explore a new direction in reading and creating literature sublimity and dhvani uh, in poetry raises its quality and uplifts the soul of the readers and adherers because the poetry consisting sublimity and dhvani is the best type of poetry according to longinus and anandavardhana Uh, in this paper we compared all the aspects of these theories and conclude their sublime of way and funny of which the same theory to its two different things thus we can say that anandavardhana is the longinus of this is, and longinus is the anandavardhana of this uh thank you so much i am uh, i am thankful for to uh, respect so much distress for giving me the opportunity to present my paper ओम शांति 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 हरि ओम तत्सत श्री राम कृष्णा प्रणमस्तु थैंक यू सो मच शुभदीप इट्स अ वंडरफुल लेक्चर यू हैव ऑलमोस्ट टच्ड ऑल द एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ ध्वनि थियोरी यू हैव कैटेगराइज्ड ऑल द पार्ट्स ऑफ काव्य एंड कंपेयर्ड ध्वनि विद सब्लाइम सब्लिमिटी द सब्लाइम थियोरी बाय लॉन्जाइनस एंड अदर्स uh i must say it's a uh, good uh, lecture and good paper it will be an asset for our um, forthcoming book if it will happen thank you so much if thank anyone you. have any questions uh, on subodip's uh, paper uh, if please feel free to comment Uh, shivli madam if you have anything to comment uh... okay so um, i think okay there is no one to comment okay then we move forward um, thank you subodhi begin for your paper thank you sir thank you sir thank you please please be with us please now it's time to our second paper presentation and the paper will be presented by uh, dr jhorna rani tripathi assistant professor of sri sri university kotak urisha uh, the title of her paper is aesthetic approach on anandavardhana in indian poetics I request Dr. Jhorna Rani Tripathi, ma'am, uh, to please come forward and, uh, and deliver her paper. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, am I audible right now? Yes. Yes. Clear. Ah. Uh, 
ओके ओके सर uh sir kindly wait for the some time actually now i'm going to be uh share the screen yes please Ma'am, we cannot see you or hear you. Please. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Am I audible right now? Yes, you are audible. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Just a minute. Sir. Just a minute. Uh, so it is visible right now yes yes visible thank you so much sir uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, myself dr jharna tripathi uh, i am the assistant professor of cc university kattagodi sir so uh, i am going to be uh, say something on my topic aesthetic approach of anandvardhan in indian politics so first of introduction here is play so uh, the alankar shastra is ordinarily used to signify literary uh, criticism of politics in sanskrit grammar or uh, sanskrit literature also but it is literally means only the figure of speech so even three it is taken in the earlier and wider sense of beauty of poetry it does not convey the ideas of understanding or appreciation and judging that and primarily denoted so as it literature forms one of the most important branches of the like, culture of any nations so it has its distinct place as the uh, path that leads to be the function of literary criticism more especially literary of the criticism in sanskrit so it is a very effective uh, uh, just alankar shastra and the alankar shastra is commonly uh, believed to be the branch of knowledge which deals with the figure of speech so uh, we can uh, we can uh, Uh, right, we, we can take such. It, it is the most might easily say that literary criticism in the Sanskrit is the based on dogmatic criticism, which is traditional written. So, Alankar Shastra should be the understood everyone the, of the research scholar. So, where the Bhaman also explained the term of Alankar is the uh, is the means. Uh, it is the means of Alankar is shod. So, sahrdaya ha, shodaya ha, beauty of literary the charm in general. so uh, my next a uh, slide so uh, come to the dhoni so anandavardhan is just uh, telling the dhoni is the most important of the uh, this uh, all the said vedangas so dhoni is the soul of poetry so uh, come to the question is the point so what is the soul of poetry so uh, generally we know the uh, what is the dhoni is the uh, sport of agya dhoni so the question is that originated the before the date of anand vardhan he is uh, he say ki dhoni is the soul of kavya or poetry so dhoni theory still stands the most of the important one among the uh, eight school of critical thought it mainly deals with the major problems like the essence of poetry kavyas so anand vardhan established the concept of dhoni is the soul of poetry so uh, he says the work is uh, he accepted one it is it was the latter established on a strong footing by uh, uh, avinav gupta so who wrote an exhaustive commentary in dhvanaloka named uh, lochana dhvanalok lochan so it really eclipses all the other formal uh, commentaries he says 
केमलोचना विनायक वक्ति ही या पे ही चंद्रिका या पे ही सो धोनी थ्योरी इज द यूनिवर्सल सो धोना लगा इज द लिमरेश ज्वेल इन द स्टोर हाउस ऑफ द संस्कृति लिटरेचर द धोनी थ्योरी द धोरी विश्वास केम इन टू लाइम लाइट इन द नाइन सेंचुरी एरिया सो थ्रो द ग्रेट एक्सपोर्टेड ऑन द वर्धन डोमिनेटिंग इंडियन पॉलिटिक्स फ्रॉम द नाइन टू ट्वेल्थ सेंचुरी so there been completely recognized alankars gunas ritis uh, so we say about the um, all sastras alankar guna riti hi bakrati uh, hi ochitya in the light of the theory of dhuni so they were compelled to recognize the fact that they were put with the life life factors to the poetry only uh, so far is the feature of the uh, say in the feature of the dhuna loka ka dhuna loka lochana so this is the integral part of the imaginations so next one is dhoni definition so dhoni is a type of poetry where is the words and sayings lost their primary significance in order to suggest other things so having ananda vardhan's inbox so open is searching study of words and then ways in poetry so one is the well known traditional or conventional meaning the other is the metaphorical meaning occasioned by the specifics of the context so the meaning the meaning plays a part in the poetry too so it is the dhoni is the uh, suggestion is function the words is exclusively found in the poetry where the ideas are never directly expressed but only the suggested so suggestion has thus is independent existence so it cannot be found without the aid of the other two varieties of the meaning so next next slide yes uh here i define the different way so uh, dhoni is dhoni that we the suggest vyanjaktah both suggestive and many so to a part two is dhvaniktah naiti hi the function of the suggested sense to dhvanah vyavranah third one is dhvaniti that which is suggested by dhvanantaram such as the content to third th uh, the fourth term dhoni is the applicable to sabda arth and vyapara both individually and collectively so dhoni has been employed in is the collective sense is the primarily applied to kavya so we says that is the kavya is, uh, is also uh, completely defined by the dhoni so uh, the theory of the dhoni was expound is the most significant principles in the literary criticism by the new school of critics of held by anand vardhan so the great acharya vinava gupta also wrote is the elaborate in the authoritative commentary on the dhana loka for in the he is the explain all the implications involved in the theory with the aids of copious illustrations killed out from the whole range of sanskrit literature grammar also criticism the so, masterly treatment of the subject by anand vardhan combined with the authority and interpretation of this avinav gupta was able to overcome all opposition uh, of the theory by the rival school and in, uh, in uh, all criticism universal and mentions and accepts all the later theories all by accepted by avinav gupta yes uh it is the uh, some estimate uh, here i mentions uh, some estimate of the anand vardhan in his work dr k krishna murthy says i uh, like the ancient writers on sanskrit there is who am at nothing more than provision of the elaborate system of device with ample division subdivision capable of the mechanical application so anand vardhan initiated the board general principle of the poetry based on in insight into the psychology of human nature so instead of the young literature uh verbal artisties uh like we will we are telling like guilt of glamour of the expressions imaginary so for table the strictly demonstrating that em emotive suggestive significance is very soul so by truly explaining the linguistic and logical implication by theory of dhoni he tried to secure for the high place of honor in the eyes appreciations and thinker alike so all the works is just done by dr k krishna murthy so coming to the point on the sublime of longinus so longinus define sublime is a kind of loftiness and excellent in language raising the style of the ordinary language so sublimity springs from a great and lofty soul thereby becoming a one each of a great soul so it should not only be distinct and excellent is the composition but also move the readers along the effect of the pleasure or persuasion so such effects should be the subtle flashing at the right moment so scattering the everything before it like the 
thundered bolt and once displaying the power of plenitude in this sense sublime in the lofty and excellent poetry creation with power to please so persuade and move the readers through the upliftment of the shoals so sublimity is the thus the aesthetic upliftment of the soul through the recognitions of the poetry inspirations and ethical mastery of the writers so uh, you are saying uh, we are saying like onongilus believe that sublimity is the achieved by a depth handling of nature and art which is the inborn genius and land skills though the, the five sources he mentions for the sublime are either related to the author of the poem or in the course of dealing with the source of the sublime longinus even different ट्रू सबलाइन बिटवीन द फॉल सबलाइन तो कुछ कुछ बताए हैं वो अलग अलग वे में वो बताए हैं so coming to power of forming great conceptions so it is considered with the uh, grounded of throat in writers and the first essential source of sublime so left in natural expression is possible before i told that so if they are novel and lofty tools so such elevating tools whatever uh, remain is the each of great soul are possible when the author is power of the forming great conception or means or ignorable thoughts can never energies of lofty utterance so the great thoughts come from the imagination of a great creative genius from the sound interpretation of the im imagination of the creature or imitation of the natures or a great or procedures so the, 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 all our details of the conception should be so chosen to the form or organic whole being so uh, we we are seeing like application of all the details of the given subject so all those are the vivid use of the imaginary or theoretical powers so next one is the due information of the use of figure of space the third source of the sublime is the poetic use of the language the formation and use of the figures both the elevated expression if they are the properly used such a use of the figures should not be mechanical and forceful they should be the used genuinely and as the uh, demands of the uh, environment so all our longinus deals with some major figure of space to him so the proper use of the arithmetical questions makes an immediate appeal or emotion so it is a statement in the questions from their suggest so is a direct address to the person so a thing or a abstraction or readers that helps to move readers so the omission of the conjunction gives the quick movement feelings or emotions so hyperdation is the intentional inversion to word so design the special emphasis or climatical effect so uh, anaphora then periphrasis all etc so it will the give bolas to lofty in visual expression the lenses and the soft use of figures and the physical and intimacy of country with the thought of emotions the next one is novel or distinctions so the four source of the sublime is distinction it includes choice and arrangement of the words so longinus uh, say that the use of the proper or striking words enter like uh, whole attentions the hearers the words to him should be the novel corresponding to the subject matter and emotion so is the impart grounded and beauty giving breath in the dead things uh so now i'm going to be conclusion part so in my view the contribution of the anandavardhan to the field of politics marks the glorious era in the elevation of the indian politics the concept dhoni which was highlighted by anandavardhan is the very uh, nerve of our political expression and communication upon a new dimension of doing poetry so it will be uh, it will be part of the emotions and feeling could now the pattern in communicated the with in intensity that no amount of uh, embellishment so could achieve so anandavardhan treatment the dhoni was so um, no, profound that he could draw of as many as the 15 one different varieties of the dhoni is the magna opus dhona loka wo usme bataye so he elaborated the appreciated of poetry also to the whole new height by the bringing out the subtle sense abilities expected or idol insert or poetry so the concept of dhoni is instrumental is creating or profound emotion emotion like a bhava ha the results in the experience of the rasa so if dhoni was the tool of poet expression then rasa was its end so this is the clear also from the effect of anand vardhan plus the rasa dhoni above vastu dhoni and the alankara dhoni alankara dhoni so the method of uh, anand vardhan says was the highly focused at is the evident uh, evident form is the concept of angirasa that dominates the over the entire 
particular verse so angirasa prevents the uh, mainly fragmentation of the emotion in the word and reasons greater or emotional depth of the word the approach the ananda vardhan excel also in the integral approach or vice so so he accord the proper place to all of the elements of poetry like gunas riti what is the all all so it does not attempt to battle to sideline them so he scores over is the critics and criticism little criticism by the clarity with which he expound the explain is concept preventing the any misunderstanding about this concept so uh, ananda vardhan says the uh, was highly uh, he is mentioned see rasa dhvani eva vastu dhvani in alankar dhvani is the three methods are in complete thank you so much sir thank you so much ma'am thank you so much for your wonderful lecture wonderful presentation on aesthetic approach of ananda vardhana in indian poetics i have a suggestion ma'am for you if you uh, could uh, if, if it is possible for you to change the title i mean i yes. want as as a word or uh, from the western perspective in the title yes, then yes, it will yes, be yes. appropriate for our uh thank webinar. you so much, thank you so much. Yes, if you do that uh, it will be much helpful for me thank you thank you so much for your time and your yeah thank you so much yeah. uh, any any questions are having please kindly yes ask. yes uh, i'm going to say that uh, if you have any questions or comment on uh, dr tripathi's presentation please feel free to ask I think there is none. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. So we move forward. Sorry. Now it's now it's time to our uh, for our validatory session. Uh, three of our academic sessions have been completed by now, and uh, we will uh, move forward to our. the final and validatory session the validatory address will be given by uh, professor rohunath ghosh sir mm, he is already with us i think so professor ghosh if you could unmute yourself and yes yes yeah. sir you are yeah. visible and audible clearly mm -hmm. so now uh, it's time for our valedictory speech the title of the speech is the concept of dhvani and western thought of catharsis a comparative study uh, before professor uh, go starts uh, I, uh, i i i am taking this opportunity to introduce uh, him to our wider audience professor raghunath ghosh uh has pursued his bachelor's masters and phd degree uh, respectively in 1970 1972 and uh, phd in 1982 from the same university that is calcutta university university of calcutta uh, with flying colors his specialization uh, academic specializations are indian philosophy in general and naya navya naya in particular modern indian philosophy the title of uh, his phd thesis was uh, vyapti and the means of its knowledge according to the navya naya system of philosophy uh, before joining uh, to the uh, department of philosophy university of north bengal uh, uh, as a lecturer in 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 uh, 1980 1980 he was a lecturer at gobardanga hindu college for one year and then uh, for five years at mohishadal raj college then he um, uh, he was uh, he he joined as a reader at uh, nehu that is north eastern hill university but left on health ground and again joined the university of north bengal uh, in 1986 and uh, retired uh, from the same department that is department of philosophy in in 1915 as a professor uh, then he uh, in 2016 uh, he was awarded the very prestigious uh, ugc 
uh, emeritus professorship uh, in the same university, University of North Bengal. And recently, in 2022, uh, he was also announced. Uh, it is announced that uh, he will be a university emeritus, honorary emeritus professor in the uh, University of North Bengal. So many uh, many administrative uh, experience uh, uh, many administrative works has been uh, have been assumed by him uh, throughout the through through throughout these years uh, firstly he uh, he he assumed the office of the head of the department of philosophy nbu four times uh, 1991 to 1993 1999 to 2001 2003 to 2005 and again and lastly in 2000 uh, 7 to 2009. He also assumed the office of the Dean, Faculty of Arts, Commerce and Law in the same university, that is North Bengal University, uh, for two terms, 2005 to 7 and 7 to 10. Mm. He was awarded the Indo-Netherlands, Indo-Finnish, Indo-French Cultural Exchange uh, Fellowship in 1996-2000 and 2007 respectively by the UGC and ICPR. He was also uh, visited many, uh, many, many uh, foreign countries uh, for many international programs, academic international programs. He visited and delivered lectures on Indian philosophy, uh, mainly on Indian philosophy, classical and modern at Khan Institute, very prestigious Khan Institute of University of Leiden, Netherlands under Indo-Netherlands Cultural Exchange Program in 1996. On invitation, he visited uh, Mission des Sciences del Homme Institute of Human Science, Paris, fr uh, France, five times for his personal research and exchange his views on uh, the research with uh, the French colleagues in 1996, 2000, 2003, 2006, 2008. He visited and delivered lecture on uh, relation as a category of real at King's College, very, very well known King's College, University of London uh, in 1996. He participated and presented paper in various uh, other universities of the world, like Hiroshima University, Japan in 1997, uh, University of Saarland, Germany, uh, University of Freiburg, Germany into the, in 1998, uh, the Boston University, USA in 1998, um, uh, and the Department of Indology, University of Leipzig, Germany in 2014. He visited also uh, the Tibetology and the Buddhist Studies Department, Vienna, Institute of Tibetology and Buddhist Studies, Vienna, Austria in 2008, um, and again, uh, Austria uh, and, 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 and other universities of the world. Uh, Many awards and recognitions uh, have been received by Professor Ghosh uh, through, uh, throughout his illustrious career. Some of them are worth mentioning. He received the Best Book Award for the book entitled Relation as Real, a Critic on, of Dharmakirti by Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi in 2001 and 2002. He appointed National Visiting Professor uh, in the year 2013-14 by Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi. Uh, his colleagues of the Department of Philosophy, North Bengal, have brought out a volume to felicitate uh, him on the occasion of his retirement in 2015, uh, Philosophical Papers. A book entitled Humanity Over and Above Divinity, Essays in Honor of Professor Raghunath Ghosh, uh, has been edited by uh, Ranjit Kumar Barman uh, and others uh, from New Delhi. Uh, in 2017 uh, in his honor so um, the list is very long uh, so i uh, i i uh, rather it will be uh, <coughs> good to skip it uh, so i now request professor ghost to come forward and uh, and and uh, uh, and request him to <coughs> deliver his valedictory address thank you sir uh uh, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you, Shomujit, for your nice introduction and very elaborative introduction regarding me. So 
I am thankful to you for giving such a such an introduction and inviting me for delivering the valedictory address in the prestigious seminar on aesthetics. So I would like to share some of the views with all of you. And first, I, though I have told that there are two main concepts. In Indian side, there is a concept of dhani, and in Western side, there is a concept of catharsis. I would like to compare between these two. But before that, I would like to tell you some things, some introductory words about the Indian aesthetics. Indian aesthetic, as you know, is very much known to us as both objective and subjective. So far as the Ananda Vardhan is concerned, Dhoni is the objective thing, Dhoni Ratma Kabbasho. Riti, according to Bhaman, is objective, Riti Ratma Kabbasho. And Vishwanath, Kuntako, Bakrukti, and Rasha theory, they have developed. But some of you uh, is one thing that this is the body and self. There is always a distinction between body and self of literature. As a human being has two parts. In one side, the obayabo, and the other side, there is obayobi, that is soul. And regarding the soul of the poetry, there is a controversy of opinion among the scholars. However, uh, I, I don't think that these are essential nowadays because you have already known regarding the concept of Riti, concept of Bakrokti, concept of Alankara, Riti and Dhani. But at the, at the same time, I'd like to point out that subjectivity in art is also in the Indian philosophy. How, when we talk about the objectivity, we are talking about some of the salient feature of the body or soul, which is called soul. That is, might be dhani, might be riti, might be vakrakti. But so far as the subjectivity is concerned, if we go through, my friend earlier speaker told about many things on dhani of Ananda Vardhana. But Dhani is the Atma of Kabbasho. At the same time, I would like to point out that the subject, the objectivity, the object is Dhani. But subjectivity is not also completely denied by the Indian thinkers. So if a question is asked, whether art is subjective or objective, we will have a problem, puzzling question. If we go through Obhinava Gupta's commentary on Lochana, commentary entitled Lochana, or Obhinava Bharati <coughs> on Natya Shastra, you will see their subjectivity is taken into the account. How subjectivity? Because Obhinava Gupta emphasizes, Ananda Vardhana emphasizes on the outer part. Dhani is the essential part of a poetry. 
But when Dhani is interpreted by Obhinava Gupta in his Lochana, it has become subjective. Obhinava Gupta has told that without the sharing of the feelings, one cannot have aesthetic experience. Sharing of feelings means our soul or self goes to the object, dramatic character, and identified with it, which is called Shadidayatto. Shadidayatto, that is Samanani Hridayani Yesham. There are three levels. One, one who is the writer of the script, Drama, drama writer, the second, the characters who are playing different roles, and third, the audience. And it has been told that in the three levels, there is no watertight compartment. Water comes from dramatic person to dramatic character, from dramatic character to the audience. Ultimately, same water covers the whole area. That is why it is Shadhidayata. It is called Kanoishwarness. So if I want to enjoy a drama or novel or any type of piece of literature, Shadhidayata is the essential factor. And that is why Ananda Vardhan told that Dhani is Shadhidaya Slaggo. It can be appreciated only by the connoisseurs. And taking clue from that, Obhinava Gupta comes to the conclusion that Shadhidayata is ekarupata, having same type of feelings. Our self is identified with the dramatic character. So, this type of thing, while Ananda Vardhana emphasizes the objectivity of literature, like Dhani, which has to be created through language. Uposharjani krito sartho vyanto kabbo vishesha dhani riti kotito shurivi kotito. So there is benjito. But Obhinav Gupta, while interpreting this, he has come that dhoni is the instrument through which we can identify ourselves with the dramatic character and share the same feeling. Share the feeling of dramatic character. So he has quoted, Obhinav Gupta has quoted a Upanishadic line from Brihadaranya Gopanishad. And he told the same theory is applicable to drama, applicable to literature also. What is that? There it is Natu Poti Kamayo Poti Priyo Bhavati Atmanustu Kamayo Poti Priyo Bhavati. There is a theory be, behind the philosophy of love. Philosophy of love may be interested love, may be disinterested love. I love my son. Not that he is a son, but he is a part of me. Putra kamayo putra priyo bhavna bhavati atmanastu kamayo putra priyo bhavati. In the same way, when we see the drama, we share our feeling as if I myself 
has become the dramatic character. In Pothir Pachali, when Durga is died, small girl, mother is lamenting, Hakar of the mother is completely shared by Kanoishar as if he has become mother and sharing the feeling of death of his son. And this type of identification is called self-identification. So there is a long list in Brihodaranya Upanishad. Here also, when we are identifying ourselves with the dramatic character, we are subjectifying ourselves. I will come to that. Before that, my friend, I would like to tell one line about the Western philosophical system. You know, in India, it is called Rupaka. So there are ten types of Rupaka. Drama is called a kind of Rupaka. Whatever is going on in outside is being enacted in the play. So it is Rupaka. And it is created by the poet. Maybe the fact may have connection with history, fact may have connection with reality, but it is not the carbon copy. Plato told it is imitation, onukarono. But I think Indians won't believe this onukarono theory. Western also, not all are believing in Onukarana theory, imitation theory. They think it is not carbon copy of the past. Whatever drama is written, in the drama I have shown my originality, I have shown my creativity. Otherwise, what is the contribution of it? So, Kobi, there is a single term for a Kobi and a philosopher. For a poet, for a literary person, person and a philosopher. Poet and philosopher, that is Kobi. In Upanishad, Kobi means both. Who can see the future? Kranto Dorshi. And Kobi is Kranto Dorshi because they have vision. And philosophy is also Kranto Dorshi because they have also vision. In literature, when a poet writes something, he can see the future and write. Apare kabbo samsare Kobi re prajapati. Prajapati is Kobi. Kobi is the deity of creation, Hiranyagarbha. What can he do? He can create the world as per his own will. Yasmai Rochate Visham. I want to create this world in this way. And Rabindranath told, that the Ayodha which is created by Balmiki. Kobi Bar, Tabo Janambo Bhumi Ayodhar Che Shotto Janu. As if it is something more real than the birthplace of Ramachan. So this is creativity which is to be taken into account in Indian thinkers, among the Indian thinkers. In Western also, they have taken it a kind of objective feeling. Catharsis means a kind of chemical element 
which can modify, which can purify our body. So catharsis means purification of body. Suppose if something is hard to be boiled, you put some thing which can help the thing to be boiled. And then the, poor, the thing you put in favor of boiling something is the catharsis. It helps to boil the thing more because if you boil it normally it will take one hour and if you put some chemical in it then it will help to boil the thing within 15 minutes. So here it is told and catharsis is the word taken from our medical science. The concept is taken from medical science. If body is imbalanced, suppose our body, shariram, and you know in our body, if it is imbalanced due to, due to the over and under influence of the constituents is called imbalance. Then catharsis makes his balance. And if we go through Indian medical signs, Charak Sangita, and also Vaisheshika, Prashastha Padavarsha, you will see that in our body there are three balancing factors. If there is imbalance among the three, you will be sick. These three elements are bayu, pitta and cough. Bayu is a wind. If you have excessive wind, you, are, you will feel sick. Pitta, excess of bile, then you will have problem. And cough, cough is the beautiful term, both English and both Sanskrit. Kapadi Sanskritam, it is in Kautilla. Kapadi Sanskritam. So cough, though the spelling is different, but the, the phonetic, phonetically it is same. So if you have cough in your body, then also you are imbalanced. Then catharsis is essential. You need some medicine so that three things are made balanced. So I am quoting from a Charak Sanghita. And it has been told in Charak that in our body, human body, three elephants are moving. What are the three, three elephants? Bayu, Pitto and Kaup. And they are moving in an imbalanced way. How to make this balance? Then you need some more powerful animal who can control the three elephants. That powerful animal is lion. So Charak says, Bayu Pitto Kofi Vhanam Shoriro Vano Charinam Eko Ebo Niham Tasti Lobonadra Koke Shori. So here, Bayu Pitto Kofi Vhanam, they are evil, they are just like elephants. Moving in our Shoriro Vanocharinam, in the forest of our body. And this is aimlessly traveling, not in a disciplined way, because they are imbalanced. And if you want to make them balance, Eko Ebo Osti. Nihantasti. Who is that? 
Kesari Singh. What type of Kesari? In case of Ivo, Singho is the most powerful. He can kill, balance the three elephants. So far as Bayu, Pitto and Kop is concerned, Kesari is Lobon and Adrak, salt with ginger. So this is catalyst. This is called catharsis. If you put Lobon Adrako, then all the this imbalance, non-imbalance in your body will come to be balance. That's why catharsis is not only in the case of medical science. Catharsis, some helping factor is needed in moral impurity and religious impurity. If there is moral impurity, catharsis is counseling to give advice, to teach moral books, panchatantra like this. So this is moral impurity and also there is religious impurity. Aristotle told, in our Shastra Prayaschittadi is meant for religious impurity. If you have some sort of impurity in your mind, catharsis is Prayaschitta. So just like medicine, so in case of moral philosophy, counseling, advising, in case of religion, pious chittadi, etc., taken as means of purifying and the means of purification so that it can be balanced. Immorality can go away, non-religiosity can go away. It is through catharsis only. Each human being has got some sort of madness or emotion. Human being is emotional being. Emotion when boundless is called madness. And if it is not allowed to go out, I have madness, I am overwhelmed by emotion. Then what will be the way out? If it is not allowed to go out, if we don't get any outlet to pass the emotion, it becomes furious. Emotion will be furious, will be poisonous, will be harmful. But if you find some outlet to get out the emotion, then you will feel relief. Any emotion, emotion just like water, which is bound water, bound through the dam. Suppose there is a dam, and the other side of the dam there is water. Water is irresistible becomes irresistible. If it faces resistance, then emotion also becomes more powerful, just like water in a dam. If water is bound in a dam, the water becomes powerful, much more powerful, and ultimately it can break the dam. In the same way, our emotion, if it is confined in our body, if we do not let it go outside, then it can destroy the whole system. So how can, I, what is the outlet of passing the emotion which is, which is very much in our body? 
Aristotle is telling music can make this emotion lighter. Dance, music, literature, these can make our emotion lighter from heavier by way of driving it from our body. This is the outlet. When we hear music, our troubles will be less. When we see the dance, our trouble will be less. Because this music, dance, literature, they can give you some non-pathological pleasure, disinterested pleasure. And if you have some disinterested pleasure, non-pathological pleasure, then pathological pleasure will be lightened, will be less. Therefore, music, dance, even literature can be taken nowadays as a therapy. It has got some therapeutic value. Music is not meant nowadays only for enlightenment, but it is essential for our removal of disease. If someone is psychologically insecure, if someone is psychologically ill, if someone is troubled by outside problem, he can be given ther therapy in the form of music, in the form of dance or literature then our weight of emotion becomes lighter because it has got some outlet. So emotions are going out. Emo when emotions are going out from our body, from our mind, it is not vacuum. It is replaced by peace. It is replaced by satisfaction. Ah, we are relieved now. This relief is a kind of ananda, is a kind of peace, in a kind of peace. So it has been told in our Shaita Darpan Purunado Rase Jayoti Jat Paramang Sukham Sacheto Sam Anubhava Pramanam Tatra Kevalam. When there is pathos, my heart is fulfilled with pathos. Then we see the non-pathological pathos. So I feel like Devdash. So one theory, when you see Devdash, this pathos has, be, has been transformed into a rasha. Pathos was not enjoyable earlier. When it has seen some outlet, then this pathological, pathological karunno has taken the place of non-pathological one, disinterested one. That's because this pathos has got some outlet. So when you feel, when you see Devdas and its pathos, your heart is filled with joy. Koronado rase jayate sukham, paramang sukham. So here also there is, if you want to make your body full of happiness, full of rest, then you need some outlet in your body so that non-pathological pathos are going out, a pathological karunno is going out and replacing the non-pathological one, which gives you a sigh of relief 
which gives you ananda in the tragedy you will get ananda there is emotions in the form of fearfulness and pathos they are also it is replaced by bliss and happiness in the hindi film you have seen ek dooje ke liye you have seen anand this is tragic film all are died and this death this pathos is replaced by happiness because it has got some outlet it has become a medicinal value to you bishe bishokkhoy so one type of karunno can can be lost by another type of karunno so this is called replaced by bliss satisfaction so when emotion is going out it is filled with bliss happiness or disinterested pleasure emotion is generated in a literature and afterwards it is made out through some outlet replacing the ananda there now dhoni is also functioning the same thing this is catharsis which has got medicinal value therapeutic value here also in the case of when i begin i told dhani has got objective value is having an apparent indirect meaning pratyoman artha which is different from famous limbs of a body as found in the glamour of a female what is you cannot see dhani in your crude eye but you have to feel that is why i told dhani revo shod hridaya slagho if you have real heart if you have real interest you can feel if your heart is transformed if your self is connected with the dramatic character you will feel the pratyoman artho and this pratyoman artho in a sentence is not obvious it is to be discovered it is told prasiddho abhayavati diktam Not, it is available just like a glamour of a woman with due respect to the ladies glamour is also available for the gents but ananda vardhan told most of the ladies have got glamour so lavanna mibo anganasu and you know this lavanna or glamour of a lady you cannot you can feel the glamour but you cannot locate you cannot locate the glamour here it is in hand it is in the face it is in the leg it is prasiddho abhayavatirikto it is in the prasiddho abhayavo but it is something else you cannot locate it how bibhati it appears like this how labannamibo <coughs> angonasu now you you know the famous example many were the famous example for kumar sambhavam ebang badini devarsho pitu parshe radho mukhi लीला कमल पत्री गणयतीटवीन हिमालय पार्वती फादर एंड नारद पार्वती एक्सीडेंटली एंटार्ड इन टू द ड्रईंग रूम 
and she realized that hard marriage talk is going on so it is indecent for her to go away or to hear so what he she has done she has a lotus in her hand she started counting lotus petal of the lotus lila kamala patrani ganayamasa parvati so now if you take the literal meaning then one might think parvati was a student of botany in thakur panchanon university therefore she is interested in counting the petals of a lotus to see how the color is changing from morning to evening what tissues they have but history does not support this so we have to take another meaning what is that meaning lila kamala patrani ganayamasa parvati the pratyaman artho is that the parvati has got some sort of shamefulness she was ashamed of her marriage talk in order to avoid this she started this thing nowadays the lady will start seeing the the mobile because lila kamala patrani is not a sense nowadays you will start seeing mobile as if some you are reading the message of somebody else so this is pratyaman artho that that lajja which is available for the unmarried woman and this is how you got this this is through the indirect meaning dhani and dhani if you if had there been no dhani at all dhani is the matter of grinding you grind the dhani and get a rasa just as somalata can give you the liquid substance if it is grinded so dhani is the grinding machine which can give you some sort of a rasa and elsewhere it is told that charbana ananda if you are giving panaka rasavat charbana ananda if you are given a little pan you will chew it and get rasa out of that so dhani is the chewing substance and after chewing substance you are getting the liquid object subjectivity is the root for getting subjectivity and when you chew it and enjoy then it is called subject so vishwanath told correctly it is pramatri bhavo bigalana sarvo samajikanam pramatri bhavo bigalana as if the self kanaishar is expanding himself or herself to all the drama to all the dramatic character and that is why you can enjoy shoko non pathological pathos non pathological pleasure from pathos and it is said krancha dando biyo gatho shok slokatta magato so it is told in in the same book dhannalak that krancha dando biyo gatho balmiki story balmiki was ratnakara though it is not historically given but he was not a good man he was a uh, dacoit 
now after that he is transformed he is transformed to valmiki how because his emotion has become disinterested and if your emotion is non pathological disinterested then it can give you the power of creativity which we call normally saraswati kripa it is in the same book nothing like saraswati kripa ananda vardhan told that this is the power generated through your practice through dhani through through your through your uh, sharing the feeling of others kroncho dondo kroncho and kronchi they were enjoying moments at that moment they were killed by one of them was killed by ekam avadi kamamaitam killed by the fowler and this shoko is not his personal shoko this shoko is not his personal he has not lost his own son it is the bird which is lost and their shoko has been taken intentionally taken over intentionally by the poet and that is why it is called it is called not personal but impersonal noir bhakti ka shoko and if it is impersonal it can give you some power of creativity so he from this power an illiterate person like ratnakar for the time being you tolerate me that rabindranath told the dashu dalapati the leader of he told ma pratisthang tamagamo manishado pratisthang tamagamo shasti sama jat kronch mithunad ekam abodhi kam mahitam is it possible for an illiterate person to write this type of shloko shoko has empowered him what type of shoko this is disinterested or we can say non pathological shoko and after that he told he was astonished that i have written such a shlok so rabindrana told balmiki told in the in the language of rabindrana ki bolinu ami eki sulalito bani re kichu na jani kemone je ami poka prakashino debo bhasha এমন কথা কেমন শিখে নুরে পুলকে পুরিল মন প্রাণ মধু বরিশিল শ্রবণে সো দিস ইজ ক্রিয়েটিভিটি দিস ইজ আর্টিস্টিক ক্রিয়েশন অ্যান্ড দিস ইজ ব্যাংক কাব্য বিশেষ সো ডিস ইন্টারেস্টেড প্লেজার ইজ দ্য মেন্টিং অ্যান্ড কান্ট ইমানুয়েল কান্ট আই সে he has used also the term disinterested and what is the meaning of disinterested for kant satisfaction arising from the real non existence of the object i have shoko but i don't have a reason for being shoko for having shoko because i am sharing the feeling of kroncho and kronchi and become pathos become pathetic to me situation i am enjoying pathos so enjoyment of pathos is contradictory but in india it is not contradictory in india we have enjoyment through renunciation and enjoyment also 
through pathos. Uh, that is why Koruno is a kind of a rasa which is to be tested. Also in English literature it is there, our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. So Rabindranath told, Khan told that it is not there. Still I am happy. So satisfaction arising from the real non-existence of the object. This is Khan's view of disinterestedness. We call it Lokottar Ananda. Loki Ananda in our Shastra it is told, Putraste Jato, this is Loki Ananda. Lokottaro Ananda cannot be described like this. It has no relation with the objectivity. Again, it is universal. Sadharani Karano. Shakolo Shadhidayanang Eko Rupota. The universality is not of one, but the universality belongs to all types of person. Collingwood, Western thinker, call art is an expression. Expression is not ordinary expression, artistic expression, dhoni-like expression. Croce told it is nothing but intuition. This is pratibha. And you know, nabo nabo unmesha shalini pratibha. When something comes to me in newer and newer form is pratibha. And Pratibha is connected with somebody's faculty, which is called intuitive faculty. So that is Croce, art is an intuition. Sri Aurobindo told this intuition is not available in the normal level of mind. He accepted there are so many levels of mind, illumined mind, over mind, super mind, etc. and etc. He accepted that before gaining the super mind, there is a stage called over mind. It is not ultimate, but nearer to the ultimate. So when we write poetry, when we write um, some poetry, that is overhead poetry. When we say the Rig Vedic or any Vedic mantra, Vedaham metang purusham mahantam aditya varnam tamasa parastat, etc. and etc. These are mantra kabbo. All kabbo, all drama, all poetry, all novels are nothing but having mantra status because these are the product of over mind. So it is called overhead poetry. And Rabindranath ultimately called this is this poetry, etc., has come from the surplus. Pratibha, surplus, dhani, all these are coming from the inner, deeper house, deeper portion of our heart. If we are chadhidayo, we can get it. So that is why both in Eastern and Western thought, we have this type of feeling, which is called surplus, oti riktota. You might see oti, what is called the surplus thing in Indian theory we have. What is that in Nayamanjuri? It is told by Jayanta Bhatta 
that our sense organ which is seen from outside is not limited it is unlimited whatever we can see we can see more if we can arouse our surplus power so it is told in the upanishad shotra sa shotrang manasa manojat Bajaho bajang shau pranasya prano Chakshushas chakshu rati mitcha dhur dhira Pratasman lokadam rita bhavanti Somebody might tell Chakshushas chakshu chokher chok I of the eye Shotra sa shotram I I Shotra sa shotram Ear of the ear Eye of the eye, ear of the ear, Shotra Shashotrang, Manasha Manojat, mind of the mind. These are meaningless statements. These are tautology. These are repetitive sentences having no meaning. Repetition is also defect of literature. Then in Shankar Bhasho and other Bhasho it is written, Chakshushas Chakshu means one chakshu is external eye, another eye is which is internal eye. Our eye can see, can illumine those who are proximate to it. But there is an inner eye which can illumine things which are far away from us. So our ear is also like. So these are why it is possible because we have got enormous power in our sense organ. We must arouse it through our yogic power. If we can arouse it through our yogic power, then we can see the future. Yoga Jeva Prataksh we will have. That is why it is called Otirikto. So Janta Bhatta call is Otiriktata. Rabindranath call is surplus in man. There is no gods and God is only surplus power which you are having is the is the God. So if you want to write poetry, you must need Pratibha. And if you need Pratibha, intuition you must need your yogic power. So all these things are connected with each other. That's why poetry is not the normal one. It is expression to some extent. It is intuition to some extent. It is overhead poetry. And also it is surplus. Power of human being. And that is why human being who is poet, he is called the deity of creation. Apari kabbo samsari kobideva prajapti. Thank you very much for inviting me. Whatever I had mind, I shared with you. So thanks to all of you, <laughs> particularly Swamaji. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it's a very wonder, it's a, it, it was a very wonderful lecture and illuminating one. You have uh, almost touched all the streams of comparative aesthetics, truly uh, justifying your lecture as the valedictory one. Uh, you have also described the word, uh, the word catharsis uh, from different points of views, like medical uh, like from medical fields and from uh, the poetical thoughts, Eastern and Western. Uh, I have uh, no words to thank uh, an academic ambassador, I must say, uh, of your stretcher. Uh, please accept my heartfelt pronouns to your lotus feet. Thank you, sir, for your valuable time and accepting my invitation. The Department of Sanskrit, Kojibar uh, Panchar Barma University is very much grateful to you. 
sir we have a question uh, in the chat yes. box uh, let me read out for you yeah the question is from shantanu sarkar uh, mm. he is a phd scholar uh, at the iit kharagpur mm. uh, he says while the indian mind is guided by the philosophy of spirituality mm. the western mind is guided mainly by the philosophy of materialism mm. that differentiates indian and western aesthetics mm. is the statement logical in the context of comparative aesthetics this is the first question okay okay let me say uh one thing i would like to tell that it is not true absolutely that indian aesthetic theory is purely spiritual not objective so materialistic element is also there spiritual element is also there when you say the explanation depends when there is a question of dhani dhani is also in the western suggestive poetry suggestion is also in the west when we call uh, rasha that is also in the west so materialism both in in both the tradition and spiritualism also in both the tradition when croce told intuition is art it is pure not purely materialist it is spiritualistic again when it is called by kant disinterested means satisfaction arising from the real non existence of object it is not objective material it is also spiritual so both there is a intermingling of spirituality and objectivity in both the tradition because aesthetic is something which is common to all human beings which is connected with emotion of all human being belonging to india as well as belonging to western country so i am not in favor of telling that all indian aesthetics are only spiritual but i would like to submit to all of you that spirituality has underflowing has undercurrent and objectivity is also there so there is mixture between uh, materialistic animal elements and spiritualistic elements yes thank so, you thank you okay okay thank you so much for the answer and the second question is from is uh, like that uh, how can the idea of sadharanikarana generalization be described in the context of catharsis okay sadharanikarana uh, uh, that is when you are enjoying the poetry or a drama suppose what we see in the hindi film or oh, my young friends they know better than me in the film you see there will be hero and heroine heroine will come from the richest family and hero will come from the poor family the heroine will drive a car and obviously and accidentally the car will be out of order and there will be none to repair the car except the hero hero will come repair the car and get it started the car starts means the love between them starts then they will have some beautiful moment singing dancing raining 
after some time say villain will come and villain between villain and hero there will be quarreling who will be beaten first the hero will be beaten first or the villain will be beaten first the hero will be beaten first at least the hero will come up at the end he is half died he was so tortured but ultimately he will stand straight and beat the villain at that time if you see the situation of the hall you will see all the spectators are shouting maro maro usko aur maro so they have forgotten that it is picture first they have forgotten that it is shooted earlier whether you shout or not it will be in the same result it is not the football playing that if you shout they will play well so all are doing this thing among them there are educated persons like shomojit and others uneducated persons cobblers rickshaw pullers all are having same feeling irrespective of their status irrespective of their education and that is why they are enjoying all our shodhidayos that is why universalization sadharani karanam sarbo samajikanam ekoghanata all citizens are having same status of mind so this is the practical experience we are having so that is why my friend we call in case of catharsis also when some emotion is getting out of the body we feel relief we feel belief we feel bliss we feel anand this interested pleasure because some type of uneasiness is out of me so when you are shouting this is the expression of your emotion which was within your heart for long time so long hero was beaten you are emotionally full but when hero beats others then you are feeling relief and your heart has become full of bliss this is natural thing and that is why it is therapy nowadays i had been three four times to to give lecture in the polish officers sdos mlas mps and dms and the name of the course is tension management course they call me how to manage the tension i told aesthetic is the only means to manage the tension so if you can may want to seriously want to manage the tension you must go through the film or music or dance then you will feel yourself lighter full of bliss and this is the result of catharsis according to the west and in the according to east there is some sort of identification through dhoni or through alankaro like this Thank, thank you, you very much for thank asking you. nice question thank you thank you so much thank you uh, wonderful answer sir thank you thank you
and now i request my colleague dr obhijit mondal assistant professor of the department of sanskrit kochbihar panchanan barma university to propose the vote of thanks and uh, announce the official closer of this webinar with vedic shanti mantra dr mondal please thank you <clears throat> thank you dr sen good afternoon to you all uh, this is the last day of the three day national seminar on comparative aesthetics philosophical perspective from the east and west sponsored by icpr indian council for philosophical research new delhi heartfelt thank to thanks to icpr for the financial support otherwise it would have been more difficult to arrange this kind of national level seminar in this our university we are fortunate enough to have such two supporting highest authorities first of all uh, first of one uh, honorable vice chancellor dr dev kumar mukhopadhyay and respected registrar sir dr abdul kader safeli they are always with us even when busy with a tight schedule also i express my sincere thanks to them many thanks to our head of the department of sanskrit of kochbihar panchanan barma university professor dr horidas sarkar for being being with us always uh, in the first day in the inaugural session uh, we heard the introduce uh, introduction of the theme of the seminar dr sen has beautifully uh, introduced us the theme of this seminar of this national level seminar thanks to dear dr sen the seminar has completed uh, successfully through the three academic session in this three academic session we feel very honored that we have with us such a profound scholars of the entire sanskrit world professor dr radhavallab tripathi former vice chancellor central sanskrit university new delhi uh, uh, who uh, he uh, who has scholarly elaborated the rasa theory of bharata and global poetics there is no doubt that we have been greatly enriched by his erudite discourses i express my sincere gratitude to professor radhavallab tripathi for delivering the keynote address for this national level seminar and the uh, the second uh, the second the first uh, like uh, speaker was of the first academic session dr parul dave mukherjee she scholarly explained the topic rethinking comparative aesthetic today i thank to professor parul dave mukherjee professor parul dave mukherjee professor at the school of arts and aesthetics jawaharlal nehru university new delhi the second one was dr anirban bhattacharyji assistant professor and head department of english shantipur college nodia andar kalyani university west bengal he has Uh, delivered uh, lecture, his lecture on self consciousness and languaging hegel and abhinava gupta i also thanks to dr bhattacharyji on the second day the se second academic session there is second academic session the first speaker was professor c rajendran retired professor and ex head department of sanskrit university of kalikut melappuram kerala he has delivered his lecture on the language of imagination aspects of kuntaka's aesthetic i also uh, thanks to him uh, for his wonderful lecture and the second one second one was professor bijaya goswami retired professor and ex head department of sanskrit bengal 
she has delivered his high lecture on Horace and Indian aesthetics. I also uh, thanks to Professor Goswami. On the, on the third day, I mean uh, uh, today, uh, we have uh, we have totally uh, three like three speakers, profound speakers. Uh, the th uh, on this third academic session, we have with us Dr. Arun Ranjan Mishra, Professor and ex head Department of Sanskrit, Pali, Prakit, Vishwabharati, Central University, Shantiniketan, West Bengal. Uh, he has delivered his lecture on on aspects of beauty in the East and West. I also thanks to Dr. Uh, Mishra for his uh, wonderful lecture. And the second one, uh, uh, second one is uh, Professor Shivali Basu, Shivali Basu, Professor, Department of Sanskrit, Jadavpur University, Kolkata, West Bengal. She has deliver, delivered her lecture on essence of propriety as reflected in Sanskrit poetics with special reference to Western thought. I thanks to Dr. Vasu for her wonderful lecture. And we have two. Respectively, Shubhadeep Das. PhD research scholar of the Department of Sanskrit and Philosophy, Ramakrishna Mission, Vivekananda Educational and Research Institute, Institute Belur Mart, West Bengal. I also thanks to Dr. Zharna Rani Tripathi. And the last one was um, uh, uh, predatory speech. We have with us the great speaker, Dr. Uh, professor Dr. Raghunath Ghosh, former Emer Emeritus Professor, Department of Philosophy, uh, Emeritus Professor, uh, Department of Philosophy, University of North Bengal, West Bengal, and Senior Fellow of ICPR. So Monjit also has told everything uh, about our uh, um, very known professor, Dr. Uh, Ghosh. Uh, he has delivered uh, wonderfully delivered the uh, his uh, lecture on the concept of dhoni and western thought of catharsis i must say that uh, uh, many thanks to all audience for listening with great patience i must say that this three day rational seminar has successfully completed and it will be more successful uh, if all the audience is benefited if we can gain some knowledge then we can extend our research thinking much more further let's hope this have a good day thank you and i will finish uh, this uh, seminar with uh, three lines of Sundarje Pipashu, Ejunno Amra Sundarke Oboga Kote Parina. And he says, Najani Kanore, Atodin Pore, Jagia Utilo Pran, Jagia Utilo Pran. And when he completed, he told that Morite Chahinami, Sundar Bhubane. And then Morite Chahinami, Shundar Bhubane, Manusher Majiami, Bati Bare Chai. Thank you. Thank you to you all. Om Purnamada Purnamidam 
पूर्णात पूर्ण मुदच्यते पूर्णश्य पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमेवशिष्यते ओ शांति 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 नमस्कार वेभ्य Thank you.